Welcome, everyone, and uh, we're in live, in person. So this is the July 14th, 2021 meeting of the Edina Planning Commission. This will be our first live in-person meeting in more than a year, and um, I anticipate a couple of bugs, and we'll try to work through them as quickly as we can. I believe staff before the meeting instructed people in the room about some of the procedures, and uh, we'll have a few more as we go. We'll be, might be quite, there might be brief delays between each speaker like for cleaning of equipment and that sort of thing. Um, now that the state of emergency has been lifted, we are meeting in person, and public officials can participate in public meetings virtually for up to three meetings if they have medical concerns for themselves, for themselves or their family members. And I believe tonight we will have members of the Planning Commission participating virtually. And we'll, we'll be trying to monitor to make sure we get comments from all Planning Commissioners that are present and virtual. And uh, any Commissioners who are virtual, I, I encourage you, if you feel like we're missing you, you know, let us, let, try to let us know as, easy, as easily as you can. Um, we are using WebEx to connect, and there's a few things I'd like to connect, uh, comment on. So uh, com communication from the public, we really like getting communication from the public. Tonight's meeting will be the first meeting in a long time we're going to actually have community comment. That'll come before the public hearings. We have four public hearings tonight, but we also want people to feel comfortable giving us comments about our public hearing matters. And we've gotten a lot of good comments over the last year. We've implemented, the city's implemented the Better Together online system, which has been very helpful. Um, that's www.bettertogetheredina.org. And, you know, every comment, every comment that's submitted is forwarded to us and we look at it. And people can also provide comments by contact. There's a, there's a way to provide comments by contacting the Planning Commission staff also by phone or by email. And as I mentioned, we're gonna have four public hearings tonight. And if anyone who's watching on, on video would like to give a comment, they'll have an opportunity for you also. People in the room will have an opportunity to comment first, but if you're watching on video and you'd like to comment, um, call 1-800-374-0221, enter conference ID, Four one six four eight five six and press star one. We'll give those instructions again when we get to the public hearing portion. When when it is your pub, when is your time to speak in for public hearing? Everyone will have up to thirty uh, three minutes, and we'll, we'll, staff will give you notice. We we ask if possible to not duplicate comments. If you submitted something in writing, don't feel like you have to call in or come to the podium tonight because we did look at those comments already. And so I guess uh, that concludes the entrance of tonight's meeting. Again, it's a, we're doing a hybrid meeting. It's our first time in person, so we hope you'll bear with us if we have any uh, little snafus that we have to work through. But otherwise, welcome everyone to this. You know, it's great to be, be it's great to be meeting in person. So that said, uh, now we'll move to roll call, and I'll ask uh, Ms. Olson of the city staff to do a roll vote, please. Thank you. Commissioner Olson? Here. Commissioner Alkire? Here. Commissioner Bartling? Here. Commissioner Strauss? Here. Commissioner Bennett? Here. Commissioner Agnew? Here. Chair Nemrov? Here. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the approval of the meeting agenda, which was posted on Friday. Are there, are there any changes or comments about the agenda? Move to approve the agenda as submitted. Second. Ms. Olson, could you, could you do a roll vote? And for people who are watching, we're gonna, everything will still be doing roll vote while we're still working in this hybrid manner. Perhaps one time when we're all in person, we can do voice votes if needed. Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote, please? Commissioner Olson? Um, aye. Commissioner Alkire? Aye. Commissioner Bartling? Aye. Commissioner Strauss? Aye. Commissioner Bennett? Aye. Commissioner Agnew? Aye. Chair Nemrov. Sure. Aye. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is approval of the meeting minutes from our June 23rd, 2021 meeting, which were also posted on Friday. Are there any comments, questions, or changes to those minutes? Uh, Chair, I had just a couple. Commissioner Elkire. On uh, page one at the bottom, uh, section five, uh, the item was 
continue to July 14th, not July 12th, as it shows on my minutes, if I have the dates correct. I see. That, that, that does appear twice. One, at one time it says July 14th, then in the bold face it says July 12th. Yeah. yeah. And then on page two, um, uh, the motion about uh, 4628 Bruce Avenue, there's a 2.33 foot height variance and a 2.66 foot height variance mentioned. And all the conversation on that item to me was about two foot four inches. So I think the 2.33 is the right reference on that. I may be corrected on that, but I think that was right. I think you're right. And that's all I had of consequence. Thank you, Commissioner Elkire. Anyone else with anything? Motion to approve uh, uh, with those modifications. Anyone used to make a motion? To a motion to approve with those changes. A second. Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote, please? Commissioner Olson? Aye. Commissioner Elkire? Aye. Commissioner Bartling? Aye. Commissioner Strauss? Aye. Commissioner Bennett? Aye. Commissioner Agnew? Aye. Chair Nemrov? Aye. Well, and that takes us to the community comment portion of the meeting. It's the first community comment we will be having since March 2020. And in, uh, as City Communication Director uh, Benarat mentioned before the meeting, what well, community comment is is for people who are present, if they wish to speak for up to three minutes on a matter related to the Planning Commission, hopefully, but that's unrelated to tonight's agenda or an agenda, or an agenda on an upcoming meeting. And so with that, I would invite anyone in the audience who has something they'd like to share for th up to three minutes, please come to the podium. Please state your name and address. Hello, um, can you understand me with my mask on? Good. I am vaccinated, by the way, very <coughs> proudly. Um, my name is Janie Weston, 6136 Brookview Avenue in Edina. That's by the south end of Pamela Park. Um, I wanted to come and speak um, because I have seen um, over the last couple years a number of proposals uh, for 4404 Valley View Road for redevelopment of the former Burleys site. I participated um, a number of years ago now in the Wooddale Valley View areas, uh, small area plan uh, from the very first meeting all the way through to the very end. That document became part of the 10 year comprehensive plan, which we're only, I believe only into the second year of that being a 10 year document of guidance for the city and for future developers. It was made very clear at the small area planning uh, meetings that any uh, single family residential homes were not to have anything taller than two stories next to them or right across the street. The idea being that the center of that commercial, small commercial area would be where if there was going to be height, that's where it is and less effective height as you get closer to the residences. Um, the current owner of that lot and its architect, architecture firm, keeps proposing three-story um, buildings on that lot, um, oversized, many of them. But three stories was made very, very clear that that was not appropriate for that lot. There was no objection at the small area planning for three stories, none whatsoever. It was unanimous, two stories. I wanna see the planning commission stick to that document. It was residents, business people, property owners, apartment owners, we all participated. I don't wanna see an exception made to that. And that lot in particular is only one-fourth of an acre, 0 0.25 acres. 
it is at a quite dangerous, even now, dangerous intersection. Monday, I heard squeal of brakes, bang of two cars colliding, walked over there after it had, they'd left, but a lot of fluids out of a car, vehicle parts still in the intersection, and while I was discussing it with the neighbor who lives right there, um, who also heard it and looked out the window after it happened, because he was working at home, we saw one right after the other. Um, first, it was a uh, vehicle coming from the west on Valley View to turn off to proceed east on 62nd Th thank Street. Thank you, Ms. Weston. That's three minutes. If you have a, just a brief conclusion, please okay. share. Well, that vehicle and then a dump truck turned into the opposing traffic lane. And the neighbor said, this happens all the time. That intersection has huge problems. A big building is you, not going to help. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any community comment matters? Well, would we, is there a motion to close community comment? I move to close community comment. Second. Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote, please? Commissioner Miranda. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Elkire. Aye. Commissioner Bartling. Aye. Commissioner Strauss. Aye. Commissioner Bennett. Aye. Commissioner Agnew. Aye. Chair Nemrov. Hi, thank you. Well, and that takes us to our first public hearing tonight. The first one is a 36 foot front yard setback variance for new home construction at 5404 Stouter Circle. I hope I pronounced the street name correct, but pre presenting for the city is Chris Ocker, assistant planner. Chair, members of the Planning Commission, the subject property is located at 5404 Stoddard Circle. The request is for a front yard setback variance for a new home in the same location as the existing home. It's a teardown rebuild. The subject property is located along Stoddard Circle as highlighted here. You will notice that there are only three other homes along Stoddard Cir Circle and that it intersects with Londonderry Road. This is the new home that's being proposed. It's actually um, in basically the same location as the existing home. The new home requires a front yard setback variance because the requirement for front yard setback is based on the homes that are along the block. And you'll notice that um, the average is affected by the home to the south. It's much further back than the other homes that are along Stoddard Circle. So the proposal is to rebuild in the same location. Actually, it will be the, the garage that comes out in front of the main portion of the house that will maintain the existing non-conforming setback of 79 feet. The average setback that's required is 115 feet, which is um, a bit abnormal given the other homes that are in the surrounding area. It, it really is affected um, in terms of the average by that home to the south. So this is the new home. It's a Rambler, uh, one story with an attached four-car garage, which actually is the closest point to the front lot line. Uh, it is a walkout. Behind the home, it backs up to a water body. The property is affected by a 50-foot setback from the ordinary high watermark of the pond that's behind it. It is also affected by 
the 100 year flood elevation. If they were to move the home back further, they would require more fill because they need to elevate their basement out of the flood zone. Um, more fill would certainly then affect some of the trees that are on the property. So this gives you a little bit of an idea of where the existing home is currently located. And then the darker um, home outline here is uh, the proposed home. So it's, th it's the garage portion that will line up with the existing setback of that non-conforming home that's currently there. And then the, the darker orange um, property to the south just illustrates how far back um, the existing home is that's affecting the average setback along the block. This visual gives you an idea of the existing non-conforming setback, um, the average setback, and then um, the setback of the home that's directly to the south, which is almost ending up behind um, the location of, of where they're proposing the new home. So it's a, it's a one-story home. It's, it's very low profile. Uh, this gives you an idea of what it looks like in context with the homes on either side. The spacing between the homes, there's a little over 100 feet between the proposed home and the home to the south, and 66 feet um, from the proposed home to the home to the north. So the spacing between the homes uh, is quite generous, and it's a very low profile home compared to the homes that are nearby. This is the proposed floor plan of the main portion of the, the main floor of the house, and then the lower level, and some elevations of the front, north side, and then um, looking to the south, and then the rear elevation that faces west. And then this gives you uh, a, a view of it in context. So regarding the um, statutory requirements and whether the proposal meets those requirements, the proposed use is permitted in a R1 single dwelling unit district. It complies with all of the other standards. Um, it will be located where the previous home had been located, so they're not asking to get any closer. Um, the lot creates a challenge for the home placement given the required front yard setback and the minimum 50 foot setback from the water body and also the 100 foot flood elevation that they have to be elevated above um, and the fact that they don't want to adversely impact two large oak trees that are on the property. Granting the variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. It's actually a very low profile home. The applicants are hoping to complement the neighborhood with a home that fits the unique lot and surrounding properties. Um, the proposed project would also be a one-story single-family home and designed to be unassuming from the street side of the home and will be set into the existing hillside and open up towards the lake um, and while preserving the existing prominent oaks. Staff does recommend approval for a 79-foot front yard setback uh, variance for 5404 Star Circle. Staff recommends approval of the variance as requested subject to the findings listed in the staff report and then also um, conditioned on the survey date stamp June 28th, 2021, the elevations building plans date stamp June 28th, 2021, and compliance with the conditions and comments listed in the environmental engineer's memo. And with that, I will stop and answer any questions that you have. The um, property owners are here, uh, Ryan Fish, the architect, and the landscape architect are here as well. And so I will stop and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Eicher. Uh, Commissioner Strauss. Yes, Chris, uh, thanks. Could you go back to that view, the um, sort of the plan view, the, 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 the lot view showing, who's one of the early? Showing the survey or? Yeah, yeah, I think the one you had, um, yeah, that one will work. Um, okay. So the, the, the setback um, is established basically on, on three parcels. It is. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how is that, I mean, is that a rule like so many feet from, from, I mean, it's three lots. But if you had gone four or five lots further up, I mean, that the completely altered that, right? Yes. I mean, so... 
I'm just, is, is there, uh, is it based on distance from the, the site? It's based on the inter where the intersection of Stoddard Circle is to Londonderry, and certainly Londonderry that right. continues up, and there are homes that are probably more in line with the home to the north of the subject yeah. property, but the home to the south certainly does throw it off, and, and your uh, ordinance looks just at those homes that are on that side of the block along Stoddard Circle. Yeah. I mean, it's clear you have a much different picture if you have 15 or 20. Yes. Lots with what's really happening there. And here, the one completely kind of skews the result. But that's okay. But it's just one of the, this is one of those kind of irregular locations where. Okay, thank you. Anyone else present or any uh, commissioners online? Any of the questions? Commissioner Miranda. Yeah, so just a clarification. When you say it's, in the same position as the old house. You're not saying the footprint's exactly the same, but the the closest to the street is the same point. Right? That's correct. It okay. is going to be matching the existing non-conforming setback of the previous home, but it's not ex in the exact location. Okay, great, thanks. Is anyone else, any other commissioners? Uh, Planner Rocker, I had one question for you, and that is in the engineering report. Um, the engineering report talked about alternative mitigation members to the measures, excuse me, alternative mitigation measures to the standard flood risk reduction requirement. Could you explain that and what, what, what kind of, what they're thinking about and what's going to happen on this property? Well, and I think probably the applicant can address it probably better than I. Um, the initial review of it by the en engineering department, their concerns were that the basement was going to be too low and that they would have to do some mitigation measures. And that's uh, why originally this item was going to be heard in June and it ended up being heard this evening because they had their engineers work on what the requirements were for engineering and it's now been signed off on. Um, so the, they have come up with a plan that does meet the engineering requirements. They could probably give you a little more specifics on that. Um, but uh, the engineering department did add um, a follow-up memo. There, there were two. I don't know if you saw the second one. That came in a little bit later. Um, but it just was to reiterate that they are satisfied with the measures that the applicant is taking. Okay. Thank you. Would the applicant like to make a presentation? Not required, but you're definitely welcome. Hello, um, Ryan Fish with PK Architecture, 4329 29th Avenue South, Minneapolis. Um, <clears throat> I'm joined here with the homeowners, Brett and Susan. Um, they, you know, spent, uh, they love the city of Regina and they spent several years looking for the perfect lot to, to either an existing home or a new home to build a new home. And they, they found this lot and they kind of fell in love with it. And kind of first appearances, there doesn't seem to be a lot of forces to make this lot a difficult to, to build on. And it was even quite surprising to me after doing the kind of zoning review, especially to the house to the south, and that the fact that because of the two ponds and the way the road happens, there's only three properties on there. And so when you have one that's 150 feet back and one that's 75 feet back, the, you know, the difference is quite quite large so um, but they're really determined to you know join the, the the neighborhood they think it's great quiet friendly neighborhood and uh, so I, I I'm here for additional questions but also I I've added okay I've added uh, a, a few visuals um, 
into this presentation, but uh, you know, just to focus on this one diagram, the orange property is the one that is, is back, but you can see that most of the properties in the neighborhood are you know, either zero to 50 or 50 to 80 feet back, and if we were to expand that view, that kind of would be spread out even further if we were to take a greater view. So it really is a unique circumstance that the one property to the south is uh, so far back. Um, <clears throat> I thought this diagram was helpful to you know, show that really just the small part of the house is, is where the original house setback was and the majority of the house will be um, behind what would have been the average. I also uh, appreciate the house that, that it, it kind of steps, the house um, floor plan kind of steps with the two houses so the garage is kind of at a similar setback from the house to the north and then the house steps back to kind of greet the house to the south. <clears throat> this again is just kind of showing the, the to kind of the existing forces of the, that was on the property as far as you can see the, the existing front setback and then where we would have to be average and then just with kind of color you can see where the 50 foot setback is. So um, just in the existing uh, conditions the kind of buildable arrow area is being narrowed down. And then um, <clears throat> this kind of shows the green area is the kind of recommended drip line where you don't affect those oaks. And they're quite massive, really wonderful oaks, those two oaks on the property. So trying to uh, kind of mitigate those, save them, um, it narrows down the, the area, the buildable area even more and prevents us from kind of moving backwards. As well, I think the um, planning department did a kind of great job explaining the other forces. Even in the kind of elevation height, if we were to go up any further, um, we run into another, we, you know, th there's the idea that you don't want the house, to, new house to be above a foot above the existing house. As well, if we move backward, we start grading over the root structure of the oak trees, therefore greatly increasing the chance for them to to die, so we really were kind of kind of hemmed into this area. <clears throat> it's it's just kind of a, another kind of follow up diagram to that. Um, so, really, um, I, I like I said, I think the planning department did a great job. I'm I'm here for any additional questions. We've added a, a couple more views: one from the pond, lake, and one from the street, but. Is there any additional questions? Well, I guess I'll just repeat that and ask if the Planning Commission have any additional questions for the applicant. All right. Well, thank, thank you for you. your time and consideration. Thank you. Well, and that means it was public hearing time, and that means anyone who is here tonight that wishes to give three minutes of testimony or anyone who's watching us and wishes to call in can give three minutes of testimony on this matter. Again, for people calling in, I'm going to, I'll give you the call in information right now. It, it, to, to call in, it's 1-800-374-0221. Enter conference ID number 416-4856. Press star one, be placed into queue. You'll give the operator your name, address, and phone number. Um, and I'll, again, you know, I'll have three minutes, we'll let you know. Uh, we ask, if possible, don't duplicate comments that anyone else gave. Um, and then people in the meeting who are here present will have the opportunity to go first. So with that, is there anyone present tonight who would wish to speak on this matter? Well, I should do Dick Bremer and say no one's really running up to the plate here. Um, so the people who are watching who can't see no, but I guess, I guess with that I'll, I'll offer the opportunity. If there's anyone who's called in, I'll ask Mr. Riesig of the city's communication department. Is there anyone called in who wishes to speak? We do have one caller, but no one in queue to speak right now. But uh, given still the hybrid format, we should uh, give about 30 seconds or so for the broadcast to catch up. Okay, thank you.
we do not have any callers in the queue at this time. Thank you, Mr. Riesig. With that, I ask if the Planning Commission would motion to close the public hearing. Move to close the public hearing. I second it. Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote, please? Commissioner Miranda. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Elkire. Aye. Commissioner Bartling. Aye. Commissioner Strauss. Aye. Commissioner Bennett. Aye. Commissioner Agnew. Aye. Chair Nemrov. Aye. Well, Planning Commission, does anyone have any further questions or comments about this matter or motion? Commissioner Bennett. Yeah, just first comment. It is so nice to see everyone here in person, including you guys. Thank you. Um, yeah, just want to thank the applicants for a great proposal. Um, I think aside from, you know, making the most out of the existing building, this is an example of when trying to do the right thing in almost every way just conflicts with the letter of the law. So I'm glad you stuck with it. I, I feel like what you're proposing now is gonna be a better situation for the city and for you compared to abiding by the laws that are in place. So thank you. Um, I just think everything has been so well thought out and looks very nice and complies with the floodplain requirements. So I fully support it. Thank you, anyone else? Commissioner Bartley? I actually just think Everyone probably agrees, and I just like I don't think we need to prolong this. A, a beautiful job, as usual, Ryan. Um, and you guys are lucky to move into this home. It's beautiful, and you're lucky to live next to Bob Ulrich. He's a stitch. So, um, anyways, I make a motion to approve this. Motion. Uh, is there a second? Or anyone else have any other comments? I second. Okay. Did somebody else already? Anyone else have? Any? Thank you. Motion to second. But uh, any further discussion on this? Um, Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote? Uh, oh, well, hold on, just one sec. Com Commissioner uh, Agnew on online, do you, do you have anything further? No, I do not. Sorry to be so obvious about it, but I just want to make sure we don't miss you. Um, so Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote, please? Commissioner Miranda. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Elkire. Aye. Commissioner Bartling. Aye. Commissioner Strauss. Aye. Commissioner Bennett. Aye. Commissioner Agnew. Aye. Chair Nemrov. Aye. Well, congratulations. Um, while we're setting up the next matter, I, 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 I'm just going to say something so I don't forget it. Uh, this is a comment to staff. It does seem that we get these motions for um, variances for houses that are front yard setbacks or variances to front yard setbacks based on, you know, that are because of the average of the nearest house and sometimes they're affected by one house that's out the ordinary. We almost always grant that. I'm wondering if we could look at that in the future as maybe we could change the code, um, something to consider in the future because we almost always, I can't remember when we turned it down, just something to think about. Um, our second matter tonight is a variance for rear yard and lot coverage for 6601 Bizcane Bay, and I believe, again, appearing for staff is Assistant Planner Ocker. Thank you. Um, you're correct. It's at 6601 Biscayne Boulevard. It is a rear yard setback and lot coverage variance request. The subject property is a corner lot, and the home fronts Biscayne Boulevard with the side street along the east side of Londonderry Road. Consists of a one-story rambler with an attached two-car garage. What you'll notice is that, and we're just showing a part of the block and some of the homes behind it, but the lots are very consistent in this neighborhood. They're all uh, roughly around or over 15,000 square feet. They're rectangular um, in shape, so they're very consistent in shape and square footage. So this is a, an existing survey of the property, and the... Home currently is over on lot coverage. It's at 29.2%. What is driving that um, are the patio and deck areas behind the home. The existing home is under the lot coverage requirement of 25%, and the rear yard setback is currently at 45.5 feet. So uh, the minimum rear yard setback for a single dwelling unit lot is 25 feet. So they're well within the rear yard setback. Uh, however, they are over on lot coverage based upon uh, the deck and patio improvements in the rear. 
So this was submitted as a permit application and the city staff reviewed it. The permit application did not include uh, a survey. It did include a site plan. Uh, the site plan didn't have any information on lot coverage or setbacks, so it was requested that that be provided. Um, when the survey came in, it was indicated that um, it was over on lot coverage. It didn't have at the time the setback from the rear yard. Uh, and then when that was submitted, um, it was evident that there would be two variances needed to continue on with this project. Uh, they are requesting a variance to allow 26.5% coverage as opposed to the 29.2% coverage. So they are removing the patio, they're removing the old deck, but in order for them to accomplish the porch addition uh, that they would like to, and then also the 150 square foot deck, um, they are requesting a 1.5% coverage variance above the 25% maximum, and then um, the setback for rear yard would be approximately 16 feet, so they're asking for a nine foot variance into that required setback. So this is a detail showing the setback um, at the corner of the porch. The porch is, it will be this triangular portion that will overlap into the setback area of 25 feet. So it's not, um, it's only at, at, in the, this area that it would be overlapping. Uh, the majority of the improvement would be within the setback requirement. Um, they're also pulling away from the amount of coverage that's currently there. However, um, what they are requesting would still be over uh, the maximum requirement. So this is a comparison between the two, the proposed and the existing. Uh, they have this small shed that's attached to the house that will remain, and that's about 82 square feet. Um, there is opportunity, given the fact that the house currently isn't over on coverage, it's, it's under the coverage amount, uh, they could actually add on, um, and if they were to eliminate the shed, it would be about 236 square feet of coverage that they could add, plus the 150 square foot deck. The first 150 is not included for a deck, so that um, they would be allowed to have. Um, and then, you know, they would have to maintain the 25 foot setback. So there is some opportunity for them to comply, um, given the existing conditions, if they were to you know, also remove the patio and the deck area that's currently there that's pushing them um, or that, that is um, at the existing 29.1%. So this is the proposed floor plan of the porch and then the deck and then some elevations and then also um, a visual of the, the back of it and the deck area. So regarding the statutory questions that would need to be answered affirmatively, um, will it relieve practical difficulties that prevent a reasonable use from complying with the ordinance requirements? Uh, staff questions if the proposal is reasonable, the existing home is well within the rear yard setback requirement of 25 feet for, um, there's an opportunity to add on about 20 and a half feet um, up to that 25 foot setback. And although the existing coverage conditions are greater than what the applicant is asking for, the requirement is the same percentage for all residential lots that are 9,000 square feet or greater. So regardless of the configuration of a lot that's greater than 9,000 square feet, they're all held at the standard of 25%. The property would be allowed an addition of 236 square feet with the shed removal, um, and then there would be some opportunity to comply with that 25-foot rear yard setback. So the additional question is, um, are there circumstances that are unique to the property, not common um, in every similarly zoned property that are not self-created? Um, staff um, does go back to the fact that the lot is 15,000 square feet, which is pretty consistent with the other lots that are nearby. Um, it's rectangular in shape. There isn't any specific unique characteristic of the property that um, would support uh, the request as um, submitted. 
And will the variance alter the essential character of the neighborhood? Building coverage is treated the same throughout all neighborhoods in Edina. Lots greater than 9,000 square feet are held to the limit of 25% coverage. Each property in the neighborhood is expected to meet this requirement. Staff often hears residents um, from residents the projects appear to be overbuilt and massive even under our current codes. Um, that's a very uh, typical comment that staff receives. Lot coverage and massing issues are continually raised when discussing near neighborhood character with less massing and coverage always the preference for most residents. So staff cannot support the variances as requested for rear yard setback and to exceed the 25% building coverage requirement at 6601 Biscayne Boulevard. It is especially difficult for staff to support or recommend approval of a variance from the code to exceed the building coverage requirement. Uh, staff doesn't believe there's unique circumstances to the subject property. Uh, staff does recommend denial of the variance based on the following findings, that historically staff has not recommended approval for lot coverage variances based on the fact that all lots um, coverage requirements being calculated uh, the same for all single family lots. Variances must be based on a unique circumstance of the lot and not on the owner's use of the property. The lot is larger um, than most lots uh, on the east side of Edina. It's 15,000 square feet. It's very similar to the other ones in the neighborhood. Approving the variances sets, may set up a precedent that could affect surrounding properties and neighborhoods with similar lot sizes and configurations. Uh, with that, I will stop and answer any questions you may have. We do have the architect present and the homeowners. Thank you, Ms. Ocker. Are there questions? Commissioner Bartling, do you have a question? Yeah, just a quick question. Um, can you clarify, Chris, you said they are removing some hard cover? They are, that's and, correct. And so tell, remind me again, what's the percentage of the existing coverage? And then if they remove all that and then build this, what is the percentage then? Sure. Um, they're currently at 29.2%, and they will be at 26.5% after um, removal of the patio that's in the back. It's a very large patio. And then the exi existing deck. So they are reducing it, though? They are. By that's 2%. correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Commissioner Strauss. Chris, just on the lot coverage, are the driveway and sidewalks, are they included? They are not from the zoning so, ordinance perspective, but engineering does look at it from um, a uh, impervious surface requirement. Uh, right, but I mean, there's- But not a, for zoning purposes. That's a quite, okay. quite a lot. I mean, I don't know what the material is, but that's, that's a lot of coverage there too with that driveway, right? But that's not included. It is in not the lot included coverage. from the zoning ordinance. Anyone else? Commissioner Elkire. Uh, Chris, there was mention in the briefing about um, pools and tennis courts. How are they treated on lot coverage? Tennis courts and pools and the required four feet of decking around the pool are not included in building coverage for in the zoning ordinance. They're looked at from an engineering standpoint, but not from the zoning art, so they are not included. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Bennett. So a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> first thing, well, thanks for the good presentation. It's insightful beyond the packet. Uh, first, I know you talked about some of the complaints that we commonly hear about building coverage does the planning department have at least, you know, a good sense of purpose behind the building coverage, you know, statute of why it's set at that certain amount? What is the true purpose of it? Historically, why it's at 25% as opposed to another yeah. percentage? Um, it's I guess what's it trying to achieve beyond... I think it's to, to, to limit, you know, covering your lot completely, but obviously the, the zoning ordinance doesn't address driveways, sidewalks, pools, tennis courts. So, um, you know, somebody could very well cover their lot. And patios, we don't require permits for. So to see a very large patio that pushes a property over the coverage limit 
can happen because the city loses control if we don't issue permits for certain things and um, you know maybe perhaps that's why you know that this property has a very large patio so um, over time there's just been inclusions and exclusions to the ordinance requirements they predate sure. me being with the city so I can't say specifically why some things were included and some things were not so to, I guess to build on Commissioner El Cairo's question so a patio does count it all but the first but, 150 square feet of a deck or patio counts so yes but a pool or a tennis court does not currently that's correct okay I, ju I just I feel like it's worth repeating okay and then uh, another question I have just about the shed if it's a freestanding structure that doesn't have a foundation does that doesn't constitute it counts even if it doesn't have a yes. foundation structure? Yep. Okay. It should count, but somebody buys a, sh a shed from Menards or Home Depot and they put it in their backyard, it doesn't require a permit. It's not anything that the city would keep track of or, I mean, it only starts counting when somebody comes in for a permit and all of those things show up on a survey. Okay. So, I mean, if they didn't have that as part of the plan, but they bought that later and then put it there, it could comply at least with the building coverage, but not the rear yard setback, right? Because the square footage of the shed pushes them over as well, if you look at it that way. Well, at least the, the house itself is under, even with the shed. But if they want to take the shed off and use it you know, as space for something else, they could probably have a larger, um, a larger porch. That was my... Um, point with that is that if they remove the otherwise they'd have hundred and fifty four square feet or something that they could add on if they got rid of you know the the entire patio and then they would be allowed a 150 square foot deck and that's it but the shed could could be green space that footprint and then that mm -hmm. you know it would okay correct all right thank you anyone else Commissioner Wilson so and so this is all above ground yes. do, you, do we know what's happening I mean is it gravel or impervious underneath I think that the applicant could they probably, could probably answer, answer that, that. okay mm -hmm. and I mean my understanding they're not the first or the original owners of the house there was even more coverage and they've removed some of it there was a, another porch that was off the back and so um, you know I, I don't know how much more there was but currently it is over and you know we have to address that issue Commissioner Miranda so remind me again the the existing house with the existing patio is over because patios aren't permitted or it was just not detected by the city or why is it over currently? Because there's a patio there that's okay. quite large. Okay. And the city doesn't require patio uh, permits for patios so there's no inspections done, there isn't any sort of record of it, but they just, you know, it's there. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Agnew. Um, this is probably more on the theory. There's been some questions about theory, and I like theory. So, um, is the reason for a lot coverage zoning is that come from what I, I always consider stuff like that? The same thing as height and other things. Those are actually codified expressions of character. I mean, uh, people always talk about neighborhood character and sometimes things are codified and sometimes they aren't. I, I, I'm always scared to touch the ones that aren't codified. Um, but this is one that kind of is in the code. It's got, the, the city made a judgment about character and we could, we could say that's in correct or incorrect, but that is that kind of a, you know, if you look at zoning on a national basis, isn't that kind of the purpose? Yes, so just like height or setback or coverage is you know the basis for what is considered the character for an R1 district the smaller lots get to go up a little bit more to 30% or 2250 the larger lots are capped at 25% and that was put into place and at that time it was considered what was appropriate for the size lot 
Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, well, would the applicant like to speak? Again, pl please welcome, and uh, I, I, I believe uh, you have 10 minutes. Who's first? Yeah, there he is. No worries. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, Christopher Strom. I'm the architect for um, Russ and Karen Rubin. Um, I'm at 4901 Abbott Avenue South, Minneapolis. Um, I'm just across the border. We have 60% lot coverage <laughs> where I live, so uh, this is different. But um, uh, Russ and Karen uh, are going to introduce himself, or Russ is going to introduce himself and talk about the intent of their project, and so I'm gonna be brief and, and talk about the design approach, and so we'll kind of divide our time in half, if that's okay. Um, so our setback request is for nine feet, and we're asking to uh, decrease the build the lot coverage, but we'll still be over by the 25% limit. So as you saw, this is the um, this is the aerial photo. This The neighbor to the um, west has got a pool, which doesn't count in the building coverage. Uh, and um, the neighbor to, and these two neighbors have written letters of support um, for uh, Russ and Karen's porch, which is indicated right here in, um, in this diagram. Um, the, let me see if I can zoom out here. So this is the existing, uh, we're at, 29.2%. Um, it's a good size patio, but um, I think even with the deck, we would be over a little bit, and then the shed is, has been there too. Um, so we're asking to reduce to 26.5%, um, so you can see the comparison in size. Um, uh, with Without a variance, um, we'd be able to build a 150 square foot deck um, indicated here, and we'd be able to do about a 15 by 15 um, room and then with the shed removed. So this would this would be what we could do without a variance. Um, the The goal here was uh, so that they could age in place. They've lived here for a really long time. Um, place they could be outdoors and be in the yard rather than just kind of alongside of it. Um, be uh, adjacent to these two trees. Um, both sit eating out in the porch uh, and sitting out there and enjoying the yard without having to go down. Uh, a lot of steps or a steep grade. Um, so this is a example of the, um, this is the design and we specifically um, designed it to have a really light touch on the earth with just five columns. Um, it was a steel frame so that we were able to reduce the amount of wood and no cross bracing. It's completely open underneath. Um, the Edina code um, has a 25 foot setback for principal structures, which is um, you know the general house, and a five foot setback for decks and patios. And we felt like this structure was somewhat in between because of the transparent nature of it, and it's definitely not as um, as bulky as a regular house, but it's definitely more than a deck. So we're going for 16 feet. Um, and this is just an example of this is only the five five points of contact uh, for the posts that meet the ground. Um, this is the rain garden that we're going to have on the site. This is done by a landscape architect, Biota. Um, it's going to be open and, and pervious underneath um, turf area, and, and the tr existing trees are going to remain. Um, this is the memo from the city engineer um, that the proposed uh, net impervious surface decreases, um, so we don't need stormwater precautions. Um, Finally, we have, um, this is a diagram of the rear neighbor, um, the Rubens house, and then there's a the screening uh, trees between the two residences and then the proposed porch. 
Uh, and then this is the uh, nine foot drop um, diagram between the front yard and the back. So I'm gonna turn it over to Russ and let him tell you a little bit more about his project. Thank you, Chris. Um, I do wanna make one point that the patio is a brick, brick patio. It's, so there's, it's basically invisible to anybody other than somebody in our house. So we are gonna remove that given the requirements. And um, it's a shame because it's not causing any problems, but we understand the requirements. I wanna make three points today. One is the whole notion of aging in place and doing, maintaining our health and perspective of enjoying our lives and being in our house for as long as possible. I wanna make a couple of points. One, my, my wife was in a wheelchair for about 10 months when 10 years ago due to a series of surgeries. And we made steps to improve our house for accessibility and mobility for people that were in wheelchairs or using crutches. I also want to talk about my health, that two and a half years ago I was found to have a mild form of leukemia. Earlier this year I was found to have prostate cancer. And then uh, the reason I'm wearing a mask when I normally wouldn't be in this situation, that it turns out that people with any kind of blood cancers, such as leukemia, myeloma, lymphomas, the vaccines haven't worked. So I found out that I have zero antibodies as a result of my vaccinations. Surprise, surprise. So I just want to make that's an important part of the consideration in my mind. I know we're supposed to tend to the requirements and the numbers and the information and the re regulations, but there are lives involved and people involved, and I think it's an important thing to keep in mind as you evaluate this request for variance. Um, we did talk about building what fit the numbers. That, unfortunately, would not give us what we're looking for. We would have a, an addition, an enclosed porch, which didn't meet what we wanted to do, what we felt we need to have, should have, as we age. I, my, Karen, my wife, is turning 72 tomorrow. I'm turning 70 next month. So, you know, figure it out. This is what we feel we would like to have and are doing everything we can to meet the, our roles and responsibilities as good neighbors. And then lastly, I hope you have in your packets the notes from our neighbors, our immediate neighbors. And one of them was going to call in, but I think it's past their time. They were going to a concert tonight. Um, I think we've done a great job, Chris and his team have done a great job, of designing something that is going to have a light touch. It's going to be largely transparent and is felt to be a welcome addition to our house and to our neighborhood. So I think that's an important part of the consideration as well. So thanks for your consideration. Thanks for everything you do. I am thanks to, for, for you, for your leadership. I also, I just finished up three years as the chair of the Arts and Culture Commission. So I know what it's like to give time and energy to the, to the city and to our community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Um, any members of the Planning Commission with questions? Commissioner Bennett. Yeah, just a quick question. Just just want to hear. Um, so we saw kind of a depiction of what could work and then what you are proposing. Um, have, have you thought of anything in between? And what in between still satisfies or, you know, it, are you just simply over pretty quickly and then just anything different is just not worth exploring? I, I'm just curious. No, it's a fair question. I'm, the 82-square-foot um, the shed was actually a replacement for a fully glassed-in greenhouse, which we didn't use. And it was becoming hard to keep the panes of glass that cost $200 a pop to replace. We inherited that. And um, it just seems counterproductive sometimes to tear down something which works and fits and was designed to blend into the house. We, we, we could, um, but again, I didn't want to get into a prolonged negotiation with the commission about what would fit and what wouldn't fit. 
So we're putting our best foot forward with what we think makes sense and does it in a way that doesn't tax the requirements too greatly. But I mean, it's a fair question, Commissioner. I guess specifically, I, I'm, I'm personally more lenient toward the building coverage for a number of reasons I'll get into later. Um, but getting that close to the rear property line, and I know some of it's because it's considered a porch, but it seems just looking at the design that it could be offset in a different way that it doesn't encroach so much. Right. We, we designed it intentionally to take advantage of the, our, our yard, and then across the street is Walnut Ridge Park. So we have a really great view of the park, and it seems to us if we're trying to maximize our exposure to sunlight and nature and open space that that, that was part of it. But get what you're saying. Any other, excuse me, any other questions from the staff? I had one question. Is, is it a three-season or a four-season porch? It's got uh, its screen, and um, for the winter time, there's uh, flexible vinyl that you can put over the screen, but there's no glass at all. It's open deck boards uh, to the to the underside, so if it rains, it goes right through it. Okay, and then there was also a question earlier that went to staff about what the ground will be like underneath. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can show you the the site plan from the landscape architect. It's going to be. Uh, uh, pea gravel underneath the porch, which is what it has now, and then there's a rain garden to the side. Can Thank you. On that? Anyone else? I do. Commissioner Alkire. Yes, thanks for coming in for the presentation. I guess I'm not 100% clear on one thing that I'd like to be clear on. I understand the motivations and your ob objectives. It's not entirely clear to me why the the drawing that you showed at the beginning that showed how much space you have available without a variance is not enough to meet your objectives. Would you would you mind just spending a few more minutes talking about why that's not enough? I think we can build up to 225 feet to keep it under the 25%. You know, as we went back and forth on it, we we designed it to have both a seating area and a dining area so that we can use it you know, in, a, in as multiple numbers of ways as possible. If we went to the smaller size, we could do one or the other, but not both. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, then, this is a public hearing. Well, maybe we'll back to you, but thank you. Let's see. What, I don't mean to close on you. Is there anything else you wish to, to share? Sorry. Oh, we'll go to the public hearing. And um, so, again, people in the room can speak first. It's up to three minutes. Uh, please try not to say something that somebody else already said. We we uh, listen to all comments. People that are watching that wish to participate, here's how to call in to give your testimony. Call 1-800-374-0221, enter conference ID 4164856, press star 1, give your name, address, and phone number to the operator, press, yeah, press star 1, be placed into queue. Uh, therefore, is there anyone in the room who wish, wishes to comment on this matter? Seeing none, I'll go to Mr. Riesig and ask if there's anyone online who wishes to comment. We do have one uh, one caller in queue, uh, so if the operator can please unmute the line of Jim Vanderveld. Mr. Vanderveld, please state your name and address for the record when it's your turn to speak. Hi, hello. Uh, thank you very much for letting me comment tonight. Um, I'm the neighbor that uh, Russ mentioned was going to be at a concert tonight, but it was an outdoor concert, and, and unfortunately the weather didn't cooperate, so I'm here. Uh, just wanted to, I don't want to repeat what's been said before, but um, my wife, uh, Mary, and I live next door uh, to Russ and Karen, and uh, I did want to just 
emphasize a couple things that have come up. One, the the conversation about uh, items like um, tennis courts and pools, and, and we do have a pool uh, that aren't included in that count. I think is relevant from my perspective um, because uh, the Buff and Karen's yard is very open. It's heavily treed. Um, and you know the, the structure that they're talking about, uh, they fully share those plans um, with us. And uh, I was very impressed with how it integrated with the home and and you know showed the view of the of the park. Uh, I am a realtor, so you know from that perspective, I, I think it really adds value to their home. It adds value to the neighborhood, um, and it brings their property. Uh, in line with all the other things that um, you know, other neighbors are doing. Uh, as was mentioned, there is an awful lot of pools in our neighborhoods. It's almost like every other house, and um, you know that you know it not being included, um, it makes their yard actually seem actually larger than most yards uh, in our neighborhood. And I don't think that the the screen porch that they're they're talking about. Um, will seem overbearing. It'll, you know, it'll fit in with the neighborhood really well, um, just at least from that perspective. So, uh, again, we, we support uh, their request. Thank you, Mr. Vanderbilt. Anyone else online? We do not have any other callers in the queue at this time. Uh, if you want to wait another 30 seconds or so, just let anyone catch up who may want to call in. We do not have any additional callers. Feel free to proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Riesig. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? I move, to, I move to close the public hearing. Second. Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote, please? Commissioner Miranda. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Elkire. Aye. Commissioner Bartling. Aye. Commissioner Strauss. Aye. Commissioner Bennett. Aye. Commissioner Agnew. Aye. Chair Nemrov. Aye. So it's opportunity now for the Planning Commission. If anyone has any comments or further questions or a motion, now's the time. Commissioner Bennett. I'll jump right in. I, I got a question first and then some comments just to spur some conversation up here. Uh, first questions for staff, and I forgot to ask this earlier. But the distinguishing factor between a 30% building coverage versus 25 percent that's based off of the width of the lot right not the size or is it both it's the size so what is the threshold there and you may have mentioned i'm just for people tuning in sure um is this on? i can hear you <laughs> good uh a nine thousand square foot lot or less can go up to 30 percent but not to exceed 2250 so uh, 2,250 is actually 25% of a 9,000 square foot lot. So then as you go past a 9,000 square foot lot, you're capped at 25%. And what is this lot? It is 15, it's over 15,000 okay. square feet. Okay, thank you. All right, I guess the, the first comment I have, it, it was brought up by uh, the caller, so I thank them for doing that. It, if you look at the area, I think, at least to me, if you could bring up the site location sketch of 6601 Biscayne, it was, yeah, that's what it was named in our report. That one. Uh, there was one that was zoomed out more than that that we received. It was a PDF. Are you referring to the survey? No. Nope. 
It was just a site location sketch. That's what it was called in our, it's the third attachment in our. I, oh, I think it may have been in the applicant's presentation. The best, the better one. I don't see it in, oh, oh I see it, in, yeah. There's a zoomed out map on page 74 of the brief. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah, and it was just a separate standalone attachment. But yes, yeah, so that should be the same one. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words, so I'm going to hold off. <clears throat> I did not intend for this to be so old school. We usually have these things, but now that we're starting to... What do you call those things? <laughs> we need, like, a clear piece of paper to put on <laughs> <laughs> Overhead projector. Th this is nice. All right, thank you. I was hoping this is what we were going to do. Um, I feel like, as we talked about, the the goal of the building coverage is, as Ian put it nicely, to codify character. And I think it's in place for that reason primarily, and especially for smaller lots. Um, that you're not filling them up. As we know, any dyno, we have a lot larger lots, and usually it's just we don't even have this as an issue because of that. Um, but in this particular neighborhood, as I look, as a bird would look, there are a lot. There's a, to me, the character is cram a lot of stuff in your backyard. And I don't think that's bad based off of neighbors' feedback. People tend to like it. There's a lot of pools. There's seven on this sketch that I could see. There's basketball courts. There's likely a tennis court on cut off on one side. And that's just the small glimpse of probably 20 properties, right? So that's immediate neighborhood. That's a lot of stuff going on in a backyard. So as it relates to the building coverage, there's things that they could do now or later um, things they could do later um, that they could achieve at least satisfying that tonight and then do certain things later and exceed it. And they're just trying to do the right thing right now. So I'm sympathetic there. I, I feel like it's coming down in building coverage technically from what it is as existing to what's proposed. So for a number of reasons, I support the building coverage variance request. I'm I, I'm a little torn about the, the backyard setback. And I feel like there's different ways that it could be arranged and, you know, to satisfy that one specifically. So I'm a little torn there, but what is actually proposed, it being a three-season porch, glass open, it definitely has a different vibe and seems more open to the neighbors and the next door neighbors okay with it but we don't know about future neighbors so uh just throwing that out there see if other commissioners have other comments or questions well, thanks we're kicked off thank you commissioner bennett you I, bet I, uh, I, I commissioner bartling um yeah so i was some comments i wanted to make again were First of all, I see it as improving the property because they're reducing the pervious, um, in, or sorry, or reducing the pervious surface, um, three and a half percent or so. Um, not only that, they're adding a pretty extensive rain garden, it seemed, and appeared on the landscape plan to me, um, which would only improve the stormwater drainage and, frankly, the uh, aspect of the the appearance to the neighbors and what that would be versus a standard lawn um and you know seeing more and more of that i think is is great for our our neighborhood now the so to me i i find that 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 um coverage piece i i'm exactly with uh commissioner bennett on um the setback um i just want to bring up a I think it was a session or two ago, this commission approved a project that I did not, um, that did fit within the 25%, but did not fit in the setbacks, and I thought could be designed to set in those setbacks. And frankly, 
is not going to, and I think this is a beautiful design, by the way, and, and only is going to improve the the home and the backyard. And it frankly comes back to, you know, we bring up our comprehensive plan too. Um, aging in place, not tearing down homes, um, making it better for our seniors and keeping them here in our neighborhoods and not making them go into a senior care facility here because they can't find a property that they can afford anymore to be on a single level home. And so that alone, I love that you're staying in place, staying here, paying your taxes in this city and being good neighbors. Um, and I think again that, you know, tying in with nature, the rain gardens, the pieces and the beautiful design, and I know I can't vote on design, but it does help um, in, in my thought process on how this is. And also I wanted to comment on the overbuilt and massive conversations that people have. To me, I think that's cubic feet, and which is the problem. And I could point out probably 25% of Edina that has a, a massive and overbuilt situation, and I would not classify this as that. Um, they are not. They are not building up. They're not building out. They're sticking in their wooded lot. Their neighbors have no problem with it. So again, the setback could they fit into it? Maybe. But how does I, I guess your use on that? So that's a little. You know, I'm a little wobbly on that too, and how you know fitting in that. But at this overall, I think that it it seems to be in all the right directions and doing the right thing. Thank you, Commissioner Burling. Uh, Commissioner Strauss. Yes, thank you for the uplands. I mean, yeah, it's a very strong and compelling you know presentation. I, I cannot get past um, the points Planner Ocker made which to me were, um, uh, you know, the, the summed it up. She made three important points. Opportunities exist to comply. Um, the calculations for how they made the determinations were consistent with how they uh, would approach any project in the city. And um, I think it's very important, the, the, the bad precedent for uh, future projects. So I just did not hear enough to uh, uh, overturn what I believe was a strong case the city made for denial. So that's my position, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Strauss. Now I'm gonna turn my neck to the left. Commissioner Miranda. Yeah, maybe I could ask the city, oh, was Chris here? Oh, yeah. Um, so if they, cause we're talking about now the transparency of it and it's a three season porch, could it be enclosed at a future point without another variance, just a permit? Yes. So it could be, if we give the variance, it could be enclosed without yes, any further variance. Yes, it's part of the principal structure. Okay. okay. So um, that's kind of where I think I'm agreeing with uh, Commissioner Strauss here, is that um, that's kind of my point. I've been thinking a lot about, you know, because we talked about pools versus tennis courts versus um, patios and, um, Pools, I want to talk about patios first. Pools and tennis courts are pretty much flat or invisible. I mean, they're not part of the structure of the house. They don't stick out. They're not something you see or that looms over you or anything like that. Um, so I see why those wouldn't be counted because they're not part of that. And at first, patio seems kind of odd, but then you think about a patio and typically you have furniture on it. You have a number of things on it. Um, so maybe that's why, you know, the idea behind that is. But... <clears throat> To me, this is gonna be a two-story structure. It's fairly transparent, but it is a two-story structure. It's basically an addition to the house. Um, and I think what I would rather see in terms of if we wanted to give a variance would be to keep the 29% the whatever with the, with the patio and have this not be within nine feet of the back of the back lot line. So, um, so I'm okay with with size, you know, the tip, the the total size, but but the uh, encroachment, I'm not really uh, good with with something that's two stories. So thanks, Commissioner Wilson. So I think this might be a first time that I'm like completely opposite of what you just said, because <laughs> I just, um, you know, I agree with, and I'm sorry, I'm going to get the names wrong because I haven't been in front of you guys, but with your comments, sorry. Um, that you know it's it's not covering the I, I have more issues with the you know property being covered and pervious coverage and this I think is you know with the rain garden 
and I don't I don't have a problem with it. So you know, it's kind of the opposite. But yeah, I support it. Good. Could I ask um, a question for the applicant? Um, maybe this is for maybe Chris, the architect, but either of you could answer probably. Um, when you're doing the design, um, so as you can hear that maybe the 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 coverage it seems that people aren't as as bothered by as the setback. When you were doing this design, um, what was your thought process and that that angle? We heard a little bit, but why so, so far with that angle? Could you turn it at a a more of a ninety degree or at, you know something to not at least have that be nine feet setback? Could that be reduced or what? Tell us please about that a little more. Yeah, glad you asked that. We we could have mentioned that earlier. Um, like Russ mentioned, there's a there's a park, there's a like that, like you said before. <laughs> um, th there's a there's a park which is if you look straight out their backyard to the left, they wanted to have their their seating area um, as the aging place looking out at the park rather than the, than the neighbor in the back, and um, there's a couple of trees that. Um, the building is uh, designed to look between. So that's the basic reason. Did she have, did she, I think she had a comment. Yep. I don't know if that's legal, but. <laughs> um, one of the other things that we we're looking into is we have a lower level um, and we didn't want to cover any of the light that would go into the, the, the sliding doors in the lower level. Um, as my husband mentioned, I was in a wheelchair for close to a year. And during that time, I could not get down to the patio. So I don't, if I have to get rid of the patio, I could get rid of the patio. But I really would like to be able to go out. I, the chances are that I may be in a wheelchair again. And I really would like to be able to go out and enjoy my yard. And that's why we designed it the way we did. Thank you. Any other commissioners uh, present or online wish to make comments? Commissioner Elkire? Yeah, just briefly, um, I think I'm closest to Commissioner Miranda's viewpoint on this. The, um, I applaud your, your objectives and your motivations to stay in the city uh, and your planning ahead for, uh, for doing that. I think the one thing that makes me a little uncomfortable is, you know, any project like this requires trade-offs, and it's and it's hard for me to see where you're making trade-offs. For example, the shed is 80 plus square feet that, you know, may be more or less important to you in the lot coverage measurements. Um, it seems like there may be some opportunities for trade-offs in the project that you haven't taken, uh, and that could get you uh, closer to not needing a variance or not needing a variance at all. I think similar to some other commissioners, I'm um, less concerned about lot coverage, particularly as I've learned about tennis courts and swimming pools this week, but um, it seems like there are multiple good opportunities to achieve your objectives without uh, needing a variance on the rear yard setback. So that's, that's where I am. But thank you very much for coming and for, uh, for, for discussing this with us tonight. Uh, Commissioner Agnew, would you like to say anything? Yeah, I think given that that everyone else has, I will I will surely jump in. Um, I too love the idea of this. I love um, the aging in place and and really wanting to improve the properties that are here. I, I think that that's really admirable and and I love the thought that went into this plan. You know, there I have two kind of conflicting ideas right now. Um, on one hand, this would be a reduction um, from the overall coverage that we see today. Um, and so I think that that's really important to call out. Um, but then on the other hand, the part uh, of staff's comments that has really stuck with me, and I think um, Commissioner Miranda was also pointing at this, is, is the precedent that this would set um, of you know, right now it does fit into that area, but uh, what what happens when there are others that want to have similar? And obviously, we we would review them um, 
and make an assessment accordingly. But that's that's one thing that's coming into my mind. Um, so I think that there's a lot to really like about this proposal, um, but I think there's also some opportunities um, that maybe could have fit better in um, with the requirements that we have. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Agnew. Thank you. Um, I think I track closely to Commissioner Agnew on this one, including I already wrote down the question, love the goals, just like she said she loved the plan. I really love all the goals that are stated, and I really want to be a community where we help make these goals happen. And I, I think they're, they're very important goals. Um, um, at the same time, I know that in past meetings, we've even had this discussion, at, I think at a meeting or in a work session, where we, where we as a planning commission have, have, been, have, have actually recently wrestled with the idea of, um, do we give a variance, if someone comes in with a, a use that they like and the variance is reasonable, or do we first want to be sure that the variance is, you know, that, the, that, there's, a, that there, there's a need to give the variance before we say the variance is reasonable because I think some commissioners in the past have said well we feel like we're just saying yeah that's not that big a deal of a variance and we haven't really looked at the first step about well really was the, was a variance even needed here or were there was there a way to accomplish the goals that required that didn't require a variance or required less of a variance and I know that's something that we've wrestled with recently and I've heard from many of you um, that well you know we'd really like to think more about that first step you know are there are there could the goals be accomplished without a variance or with a lesser variance before we look at whether the variance itself is reasonable I think for on this matter I think for a lot of the reasons that have been stated by some of the commissioners in favor of it uh, some of the variances are reasonable particularly the lot coverage one as Commissioner Agnew mentioned uh, you know it's nice for the, the whole impervious is going down and um, you know that's really nice uh, you know and i think also people say well you know maybe that's side that that side setback that's a little too much I, I you know and i i think we're there but i also think that we'd like to maybe find a use that could accomplish the goals without a variance or with less of a variance before we just say yeah you know this variance isn't terrible we'll agree to it which i i think we kind of said that was kind of a standard we wanted to move to and unfortunately for this applicant, I think that's kind of where I'm going to be landing is the variance isn't a terrible request, but I think that there, there probably are ways, as staff said, that this could be done without a variance or with less of a variance that could still substantially meet the goals, um, which are wonderful goals. So that's where I land. Um, anyone have follow-up or a motion? Or? I just want to make a quick statement. And you, you guys probably knew this was coming back at some point. And I warned that this would be a precedent. But on that twin home that we just had, um, that could have very well been designed within the setbacks. And so now we're saying this doesn't fit in the setbacks, but this is a way better design. This is a way better purpose. This is way better for our community. And now we're saying, well, we can't just do the setback. And so I just want that to be noted on the record. Thank you. Any any other comments or motions or gestures? I'll, I'll make a motion. Okay, go oh. ahead. Sorry. No, go. This is weird. Looking at you on the camera. <laughs> Come here. Who's 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 making? Was that Commissioner Agnew or Commissioner Olson? Commissioner Agnew. Sure. Yes, I will. The go motion on. that I will. Make. Commissioner Agnew, please go ahead. I move to approve this variance um, as um, pre not as presented in the set or pre as it's presented in the staff report. Um, given that I do think that it really does align with the the goals that we've set out um, within the comprehensive plan of being able to age in place. Um, and I think that they are reducing the overall footprint of their coverage area, which I think makes sense. So I second that motion. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Bennett, you said you had further comment. Yeah, and <clears throat> I'm, I'm not going to support this one, but I just was going to say there's two variances b before us. So I support the building coverage portion of it so and and I don't know if this helps but 
it seems like there's almost unanimous support for that. I think there's ways to comply with the rear lot setback in a lot of different ways of design. I mean, you could just angle things differently, simply put. Um, so if they were to come back and the building coverage was still above, I would support that alone. So I, I just wanted to get that out there. It's really just the rear setback that I can't support at this time. Thank you, Commissioner Bennett. Planner Teague, I believe you had, you wished to say something. I did. I was just going to offer up some findings um, for the approval. I, I can do that. Um, the other option is you might want to ask the applicant if they would be willing to revise the plans and come back, similar to what Commissioner uh, Bennett was suggesting. Um, so I, those are two options I lay out there. I could offer up some additional findings, and you may want to um, also, can, before th you take hold a vote. On, let me, let me. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Planner Teague. So, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Rubin, I guess I'll ask you, so you have an, you have an option here. Um, we can go forward and vote, and, or you can come and do something else. Um, yeah, we'll be glad to do that. Come back with a with a change to with, do our best to figure out if there's a change to the setback that meets the requirements. Planner Teague, should we do anything further on that, or should we? You can do that. You do have a motion on the floor to approve. Um, but if it's denied, then he wouldn't be able to come back with a. Alternative I was just plan. thinking of going to Commissioner Agnew to see if that's okay. <laughs> okay. Commissioner, Can so I, which is okay I'm to pull the motion? Something? Yes, I think yes. that that's okay, uh, given that the applicant would like to come back. That's good. So uh, you just, so we have this, th thank you to the Rubens, thank you to all the commissioners. Planner Teague, what would be the logistics? Is this, is this, is this, like there's a 60 day period, is that told now? 60? It is in play, so you would be Continuing, the, you could continue the item to the next meeting. It might be another a question for the architect how soon they think they might be able to come back. Otherwise, we can continue it to a date specific. It could be two meetings from now or your next meeting. Well, I guess I'll go back to the Rubens and, and, and Mr. Strom, I believe. Um, what, would, what would be a good time for us to continue this to? We, we meet every, we meet the second and fourth Wednesdays so it'd be in month. two weeks. Yeah, I think we're going to need. I think we're going to need four weeks because we have to get the engineering completely redone. We have to get the survey completely redone. We could turn it around quicker, but I think just to be realistic, we have to go four. Four, four is fine. Okay, four is fine. If that's what you need, you should. Do it yeah, I just think to be. I don't. I don't want to show up without. Without it done, so. Do we need could, a motion then to continue? Could to I ask one course? thing to have for clarification for yeah, them? Yeah, no, hold on um, one second. I'll, I'll come to you in just oh. a sec. Carrie, do we, to do that, do we need a motion for four weeks? Okay. Yes. Yeah. I was looking to see when that meeting is. Uh, August 11th. Is that right? Does that work for you guys? That's right. August 11th it is. <laughs> Okay, would we need a motion then to continue? Yes, okay, so someone will give a motion. Also, Commissioner Bartling had follow-up. Yeah, do we want to do the motion first or follow-up first? You can go oh. either way. Well, uh, just the follow-up thing is, uh, what is there a, maybe, I don't know if there's saying we can talk about it all, or I, I guess I don't know the, the, how this works in that regard, but um, you're stating that you're not okay with the setbacks, or are you saying there needs to be, it needs to fit the setback, or you would vote against that, or like, the, you know, how does the commission feel about that, or is that, or do they need to prove that there is a hardship to that setback? I, 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 I think at this point that we just need to review the plan that comes back next, next, and we can't prejudge what, what we can't say we would approve X or Y. I mean, well, not that I'm not asking for yeah. approval, but I mean, I, I. I stand by what I just stated of, you know, if the building coverage was above in a similar type of plan, I could support that. And and I think they probably got a good feel of if they want to gamble on that or if they just want to comply. Um, it's up to them. 
So at this point, I'll ask for a motion to continue this matter to August 11th. Can we say something first? Mr. Rubin. I, guess my question is, do you get to I don't think it's wise or a good use of anybody's time to get into a iterations of negotiations. So if you, if you could say that, I don't know what you could say, but I would like to get some clear guidance on this to help us figure out what to go back and do. It's, it, otherwise, it's, it's really a challenge for us to figure right. out what our well, next steps are. My question, so I guess, to, I was gonna just I, I, I'm, Excuse me, Commissioner Bradley. So, um, I gotta, we, we yeah. I'm sorry, we just need to be like recognized and this isn't. Um, so, what? I'm gonna go to Planner Teague. What guidance can we give without, go, without everyone saying, well, I want, I've been spending the next 20 minutes and kind of negotiating amongst ourselves without even seeing the plans, what, what, beyond what Commissioner Bennett has stated? Um, <clears throat> so I think the direction is pretty clear on the lot coverage issue. It's perhaps a little more clarity in terms of the acceptance of the rear yard setback. Um, but again, as Commissioner Bennett stated, it's difficult to know whether it's justified to meet that setback or not without seeing the plans. So in a way, you know, you've indicated the rear yard setback is important. So if they can make a plan fit that meets the setback, great. If they can't, and they're still requesting a variance, but maybe it's less, you know, then they're taking their chances. That's, that's kind of what I've heard so far, um, unless you wanted to give clear direction on that. I, I, I don't see how we can say that right. 16 feet isn't good, 25 is okay, and I... I, I may, may I say something, or...? Sure, but then I, 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 I'm I, I just be, but hold, so hold on, hold on, hold, wait, please, please say what you have to say, but then I would like to move on to the next matter. Wonderful. And I would, I'm just making it so they don't maybe have to come back. Would we approve the coverage, but if they go back and design it and it doesn't, and it's within the setback, then they don't have to come back again. Is that? They would still need to come back for the coverage variance. E even if we approve that today. Because we, we wouldn't be, we, we wouldn't be planning a plan. We have to approve the actual plan. Okay, that's all I was asking. So have we had a motion to continue? Could someone make a motion? Because I would like to let the next two matters come before us. I move to continue to August 11th. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote, please? Commissioner Miranda. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Elkire. Aye. Commissioner Bartling. Aye. Commissioner Strauss. Aye. Commissioner Bennett. Aye. Commissioner Agnew. Aye. Chair Nemrod. Aye. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. So the next matter on our agenda tonight is a 2.1 foot side yard setback variance at 5615 Sherwood Avenue. Uh, appearing for the city is Assistant City Planner Emily Boddicker. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fine. Okay, sorry, thank you. All right. Um, 5615 Sherwood Avenue is located on the east side of Sherwood, north of Southview Lane and south of Wind Road. The existing home was built in 1948 and a second floor associated with a larger remodel was added in 2012. The existing house conforms to the required 10 foot setback on the north side. The request tonight is for a 2.1 foot side yard setback <clears throat> variance to allow for the construction of an addition on the north side of the existing house that sits 7.9 feet from the property line. Um, a variance is required given the proposed addition does not meet the required 10 foot side yard setback. Um, the proposed 12 foot by 20 foot addition is for a new sunroom. There is a fireplace that extends beyond the proposed 7.9 foot setback, but fireplaces are exempt from the setback requirements. Um, as you know, Minnesota statute and the Edina ordinance require that certain conditions must be met to grant a variance. The first one being that the variance relieves practical difficulties that prevents a reasonable use complying with zoning, 
ordinance requirements um, and staff questions if the proposal is reasonable. The existing structure meets the required setback to the north property line. The size of the proposed addition could be reduced to meet the required 10 foot setback or the proposed addition could be placed on site to meet the requirements. The second condition Sorry. The second condition is that there are circumstances that are unique to the property and aren't similar in any other similarly zoned property and that are not self-created. The required 10-foot side yard setback is the same on all lots greater than 75 feet in width that are zoned R1. The placement and the design of the proposed room is created by the applicant. The third condition is will the variance alter the essential character of the neighborhood? And while the proposed addition would not alter the essential character of the neighborhood, approving a side yard setback variance may set a precedence that could affect surrounding properties. So tonight, staff cannot support a side yard setback variance for a structure that can be designed or placed on the lot so that it meets the 10-foot setback requirement. Staff doesn't believe that there are unique circumstances to the subject property, and I have outlined some um, findings for denial in your staff report. With that, I can answer any questions. Um, also show proposed elevations. You can see um, the proposed addition is that sunroom addition with the fireplace. Thank you, Ms. Boddicker. Do any members of the commission have questions for staff? Okay. Would the applicant like to speak? notes here. Um, good evening. My name is Matt Kirshner. I'm Margaret Kirshner. Uh, so we've lived in this home for 16 years. Um, our neighbors to the south have been in the house for 40 years. Our neighbors to the north of us uh, have been our neighbors for 15 years. We're a very close neighborhood um, that's grown and adjusted over the years. And we're very committed to this neighborhood and ensuring respectful, appropriate changes are made um, to this neighborhood that we plan to spend decades to come in. The addition we're proposing is a 12 by 20 uh, sunroom. It's on the north side of the property and sits behind the fence. It is a single story only. And currently the house indents there roughly 10 feet. And so what we're looking to do is effectively fill that space and have it move two feet, two feet past and hence the reason for the variance. This two foot allowance is needed to attain, uh, you know, what an architect and our um, proposed builder would refer to as a serviceable floor plan to the addition. We're proposing changes to our landscaping to ensure that we are complying with the 25% coverage requirement, and this plan does do that. The current front of the house maintains the 10-foot setback. While the proposed portion would create a nice architectural change to the side of the house. So meeting the setback would basically make one single plane the entire distance of the home. Instead, we're making an architectural change to, to uh, make the, to, to what we believe it actually makes um, the home look nicer. And again, that sits behind an existing cedar fence. Our neighbors to the north have been walked through this plan in detail. They're supportive of the change and I believe have submitted comments to all of you as well as left voicemail for their support. They have recently completed a large patio addition in their backyard as well as added an above ground swim spa that's adjacent to the fence right where we're proposing this addition. By adding this addition uh, with the windows we've chosen and that you can see in the elevations, it actually, it, it actually provides significantly more privacy for our neighbors to the north, as well as privacy for us, as today that entire side of the house is with large windows. So what we're trying to do is really do the right thing with the existing structure that's there today. The staff um, walked through three concerns, and I'd just like to um, I guess give my comments to those. So the first is that there needs to be a reason as to why um, we're proposing the variance. And I think what we're trying to do is create a serviceable room using the space in our current backyard, again, behind our fence. It doesn't alter or change the view of the house or space um, between our homes from the street. And while it increases the privacy for our neighbors and for ourselves, for our home as well and again, with the support of our neighbors. Um, the unique circumstances, it was the other um, comment made, and uh, I think our view would be is we're trying to, again, make our existing home and property work with, um, for our lifestyle and for you know, our changing family, 
uh, requirements uh, over the last 16 years that we've been in the home versus you know, other alternatives that we could obviously uh, look into. And then the last one is, uh, as they said, that uh, it would not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. We, of course, agree, um, but that it could set a precedent. And I guess the point I'd make is that starting with our neighbor one house to the south of us, who has their property, their home built to within three foot of the property line, we're again asking to be able to do one portion of our home to within eight feet. And I'll walk through that. Um, I think it was on one of the slides. And then, so starting with the neighbor to the south, which is within a, a few feet of the property line, and then extending five houses to the north, there's actually only two homes out of seven in a row that are in compliance. So the homes in the immediate south, as you can see, yeah, that's right. oh. Oh, sorry. The home to the south comes to within three feet of the property line. The home two houses to the north of us actually extends all the way to the property line, is actually on the property line. What we're looking to do, as you can see from just on the north end of the top of this star, is literally just fill that shaded area in and extend two feet past the current start of the home. I'm not accustomed to describing architectural lines, so I hope that all makes sense what we're trying to do. Uh, our builder uh, is on the phone. If there are any specific um, construction questions um, that anyone would like to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Does any, any members of the Planning Commission have questions for the applicant or the architect? Commissioner Elkire. Thanks for coming in tonight. I really want all Adina residents to be able to do what they want with their, with their homes. Um, I do have a, a question about alternatives you may have uh, evaluated that didn't, wouldn't require a variance. Sure. Like in the backyard, you've got 25 feet to use before you get to uh, a variance requirement in the back. Yes. So why, why did you choose not to go to the east instead of going to the north where things are pretty close? Sure, Th those are, uh, one is a combined kitchen dining room and one is a living room. And so you'd effectively have to, we're trying to make an, I guess an adjacent room um, as opposed to kind of tacking on to the end of two existing rooms. So I don't know if that's clear. So you can see the dining room here where the cursor is. So just, mm -hmm. and then um, the great room. And then I guess the other piece is there's a second story above this. Mm -hmm. And so we're not looking to do a big two-story addition. Um, I, I, I guess it would just be an odd roof line. And Ron, I don't know if you want to comment, comment uh, any other technical pieces to that. Yeah, I'm not sure in the submittal if there was the existing photos that were submitted along with the packet, but um, I do have existing photos of the back of the house. It wouldn't make any sense to project and go further east. One of the things that we try to look at with the uh, building design is that uh, uh, could you keep the wall plane uh, consistent? Yes, you could, uh, but then it does create an extremely long um, singular plane and with no articulation in the architecture it really is not very pleasing to look at. So um, the design wall does project closer to the property line, does do something to the outside architecture that, uh, that is pleasing to look at. Um, and um, I think for that reason that uh, it is justified for the, uh, for the variance. Does that answer your question? Almost, I mean, I, I understand why um, you wanna go two feet further out on the north side because you, others, you have a bowling alley, otherwise it'd be a very narrow room. But I, I'm not 100% clear on why it doesn't make sense to go east. Well, so um, this picture, yeah, in the upper left. Yeah. This, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, upper right. You can see the large A-frame architecture that's there already. Yeah. So we would have to then build like a one-story, I guess, room of similar dimension to kind of, I guess, try and address your question. How would we add a similar space to come off the back of that and effectively eat up our entire backyard, whereas this is a side yard that's 
not really used, whereas our kids use the backyard. You know, there'd be no longer a neighborhood a hockey rink in the backyard anymore. It just would eat up the actual serviceable part of our yard. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Bennett. Yeah, I guess uh, a <clears throat> similar question. Um, I feel like there are, there are ways to, to achieve what you want, right, and what you need for that room, because, I mean, filling that void, to me, seems like the most sensible route. It's just, are you able to squeeze it in two feet and still achieve what you want? And it seems like perhaps you could. The, the things I'm struggling with is just, like, yes, the articulation doesn't, the lack of articulation isn't great, but it is the side of the house next to a garage that also has a continuous run. And you don't necessarily see that from the front or the side of the house unless you're standing there. So I, I feel like you could achieve it and it would you wouldn't really notice the lack of articulation. Um, second, it looks like just from the design, um, and I could be wrong and you could speak to it, it lo looks like you have French doors that swing into that room and there are ways that, you know, you can get really cool French doors that are pocket doors that, you know, might provide more usable space in that sunroom to allow you to squeeze it in from the side. So. I see like it's a 20 by 12 foot space and 10 gets a little narrow, but I, I, just, I feel like there's a way that you could possibly still get what you're looking for, but maintain that straight line. Just want to hear some comments you might have. Yeah, again, I think uh, our view is we were trying to get to a room that would be, you know, where, where we could actually use it as a family room, have a place for our kids to be with friends and 10 feet, um, you know. <laughs> a separate living space and a separate, you know, table for dining area out there. It just seems really undoable and, you know, and very narrow and cramped with 10 feet. And the extra two feet seems to really make a huge difference. Thanks. Uh, keeping the wall plane flush, I believe that the current zoning ordinance asks that there's an arch articulation after 40 continuous feet. Um, so we would be like we would be requesting a variance regardless because we're at about 49. So unless I'm mistaken about what the current zoning ordinance is on continuous wall plane. And yeah, maybe staff could confirm, but I don't think we have one. Yeah, the fireplace. <clears throat> being that the fireplace is there in the middle, it would meet it would meet the ordinance. That that's that's the architectural piece. The windows would also be yeah, included in that. I guess I'm not totally clear on the response to that. So, do we have a certain distance that we need articulation? Did I miss? If they were to shift that addition in to meet the setback, it would meet our ordinance for, they wouldn't need a variance for articulation because of the windows and the fireplace. Okay. I was just state, stating what she said and that the fireplace is not required because the windows are there and they Correct. create articulation. Commissioner Bennett, would you like to ask your question again and just so we can get a get the question and the answer pithy or do you feel like it's been covered well? I feel like it was covered well. I, it was just new to me. I haven't, I, I haven't heard anything about an articulation requirement that's come before us at all with a continuous run. So maybe it's, if it's just a solid wall with no windows, it's just something new to me, so. In other words, is, there, is, is an articulation requirement within the code? Is that kind of your question? That, that was my question, yeah. and it sounds like there is, but it just hasn't. There is one, but you don't tend to see it except for on, um, it doesn't usually apply in homes because it is a bigger distance and most people have a, a window or something, and a single little tiny window would make it. It's very odd, but nonetheless, it would change articulation. You usually see it. That's why we see 56 materials on the big buildings. Yeah. 
and because they're playing to that code and they're not doing it in a good way. Yeah, okay. No, 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 that's, that's something good to learn, but it's also good to understand like windows or a, a jut out from a fireplace achieves it. Planet T, can you confirm that that is a city code requirement? That is a, sing, a city code requirement for single family homes. Thank you. Commissioner Benzie, do you have anything further? It, I guess, um, when it, are we doing comments but before us or just no, questions? Let, let's, let's wait till after we have yep. the public nope, hearing. No, I just have we, some. Let's take all the in. comments in and then we'll give I'm good with feedback. questions now, thank you. Okay, anyone else with questions? Commissioner Agnew, do you? Sorry to be so deliberate, but. Yes, I do have a question. Um, so is the line that we're using um, the wall itself or does the fireplace count into the setback requirement? The proposed setback is to the foundation wall. So the fireplace sits beyond what the request tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Agnew. Um, well, we'll have an opportunity for questions later. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kirshner, thank you. I, I, maybe we'll have more for you later, but thank you. Um, this is a public hearing, uh, which means that anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on this matter can come before us and have up to three minutes. Similarly, anyone who's watching this can call in and speak for three minutes. So if you're calling in and you wish to speak on this one, Call 1-800-374-0221, enter conference ID number 416-4856, press star 1, give the operator your name, address, and phone number, you placed into queue. Uh, with that, I'll ask if anyone in the chambers tonight would wish to speak. Getting the wave off. So anyone online wish to speak? We do not have anyone on the phone right now, but as usual, let's wait about 30 seconds or so just to make sure someone wants to call and they have the opportunity. Feel free to move forward. Thank you. Is there a motion to close public? Move to close the public hearing. Second. Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote to close the public hearing? Commissioner Miranda. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Agnew. Aye. Commissioner Bartling. Aye. Commissioner Elkire. Aye. Commissioner Strauss. Aye. Commissioner Bennett. Aye. Chair Nemrov. Aye. So that brings up the back to the planning commission. I know at least one commissioner hinted that he or she may have comments, but uh, would anyone on the planning commission have any comments, further questions, or a motion? Commissioner Bennett. Yeah, I, I hinted at comments, yeah. Great, that was a big surprise, right? <laughs> um, I, I think similar to the last one, the last variance request that we saw tonight, I, I feel like there's ways that the applicants could achieve a nice room like this and still meet our code. And I, I mentioned the French doors. I, I mean, there's ways that you could just from function have sliding doors that then allow more space to be used in a room for furniture and other things. And I think just with, I think a 10 by, you could even extend the room outwards more. So I, I just think there's ways that they could achieve it and still be within code. So I, I unfortunately can't really support it tonight. I, I love what it's doing for them, and I think there's a way they can still achieve it. Thank you, Commissioner Bennett. Any other commissioners with comments? Commissioner Egg? Commissioner Miranda? Yeah. Um, uh, pretty much say the same or similar things. Uh, it, it doesn't, uh, you know, the, the lot size is an odd, you know, there's there, there's nothing weird about it um, that would make us uh, think that this is necessary. Um, I, yeah. Uh, it seems to be self-imposed by the, by the client. 
anyone else. Are there any motions? Commissioner Miranda, do you have a motion? Yeah, I uh, move to deny the variance request. Is there a second? I will second. Is there any further commentary? Anyone? Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote, please? And a, an I vote is a, mo is a vote to deny the requested variance. Commissioner Miranda. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Elkire. Aye. Commissioner Bartling. Aye. Commissioner Strauss. Aye. Commissioner Bennett. Aye. Commissioner Agnew. Aye. Chair Numrov. Aye. All right, well, thank you, Rosari. Um, good luck with you. Maybe come back, maybe another plan. Um, our next public hearing tonight looks like uh, be presented by City Community Development Director Carrie Teague. It is a zoning ordinance amendment and a revised overall development plan, site plan review for 4911 77th Street West. Welcome, Mr. Teague. Okay, thank you, Chair, members of the Commission. Got to reteach myself how to do this. Okay, this property is located in Pentagon Park. It's the Pentagon Park South site. It is the south east corner of the site, south of 77th Street, highlighted in yellow on the screen. Uh, this property was rezoned about, about three years ago. And <clears throat> in this picture here, you can see some of the development that's taken place. There have been a couple of retail buildings built here. There's the park plaza in the middle of the site. There's a parking structure here. So those are, and there's a, a series of, of parking lots and the, uh, the sidewalk along 77th. Property is guided in the comprehensive plan for office residential use up to 75 units an acre. Again, the site was rezoned to PUD, highlighted in purple. So this was the overall development plan that was approved uh, with this project. Again, the two retail buildings, parking ramp, center park, parking lot. The site that we're looking at is the extended stay hotel site. So as you can see, there were two hotels proposed and neither one of them have been built. They were both to be part of the first phase. So what the applicant is proposing here is to replace the Southern Hotel with a housing project. This was the site plan that was approved uh, for the site as part of that PUD. Uh, they have come before the Planning Commission and Council with a sketch plan. They've enhanced the architecture. Um, you remember it was basically just a, a block form before. Um, they've enhanced the bike and pedestrian experience. There's bike racks located on both sides of the building and there's also an interior bike room. The um, entrance to the building, one of the entrances is on the northwest side of the site, kind of kitty corner from the park. Um, and they've activated some of those, those public spaces. So here's a look at the project. It's six stories, 200 units. This is Viking Drive along here and Computer Avenue. So you can see the boulevard style sidewalks, um, the, um, the private space above the parking deck um, for the residents. This is a look from that center park. This is that building entrance that I was referring to. Again, six stories a uh, rendering of what the project would look like at night. And I'll let the architect will go through um, a little bit in more detail. So this request requires a zoning ordinance amendment to change uh, the use for that site. And it's a revision of that overall development plan to include the housing uh, rather, than, um, rather than one of those hotels. The PUD zoning would ensure that their affordable housing is located on the site. The applicant is proposing 10% of the units for affordable housing. So there would be 20 units within the building um, that would, that would uh, meet our affordable housing requirements. 
So review of the site plan. So access to the site would be off of that shared drive and entrance into the building for vehicles would be on the west side here. Again, a series of um, sidewalks uh, through and around the site. Show, this shows a little bit some of the, the sidewalk network in addition to the boulevard style sidewalks that aren't necessarily shown very well on that graphic. Um, landscaping would be code compliant in terms of the overall, overall site. Uh, Wink and Associates did a parking and traffic study. The study concludes that there's no roadway improvements that are needed with this project and they have um, found that the parking uh, would be adequate. So based on our current parking requirements, today's ordinance, 400 parking stalls are required. The proposed ordinance that will be in front of the city council at their next meeting, 250 parking stalls would be required. And that's actually what they're proposing here. They would utilize that parking ramp to the west of the building, 93 stalls within that parking ramp um, to, to hit that 250 number. So it would be kind of a combination of parking underneath the building and within the parking ramp. There would be an underground stormwater system located right here. The project would meet all of the setback requirements in the PUD zoning ordinance, so there's no variances uh, requested. This is within a, a building height overlay district that would allow up to 12 stories, and again, six stories is proposed. Uh, the building would be, um, there would be brick accents and primarily architectural metal panel, and again, the architect will go through that in more detail. So primary issue is the proposal reasonable to justify that PUD um, rezoning or the change in the overall development plan. Um, the proposed use would be allowed under the current zoning, the, the current PUD ordinance. The residential uses would activate some of those public spaces within this development um, beyond the hours of nine to five. This is primarily a commercial and light industrial office area. Um, so would bring that 24-hour um, um, presence to the area. Site plan is generally consistent with the approved site plan. And again, they would be providing 20 units to help us meet our affordable housing goals, whereas the previous plan didn't have any um, affordable housing within it. We didn't receive a lot of activity on Better Together. We did receive one um, comment today that was concerned about the plans themselves. Um, not being as detailed as other plans that we've seen, which may be true, but they, they did satisfy all of our submittal requirements. So with that, staff is recommending approval of the ordinance amendment subject to the, the findings and conditions outlined in your staff report. The applicant is online to make a presentation. We do also have our traffic uh, consultant online to answer any questions in regard to parking and traffic. And with that, I can stand for questions. Thank you, Mr. Teague. Oh, Commissioner Strong. Yeah, just, um, uh, yeah, Carrie, I, I think in, in a, a, the, the original, I mean, so the original was uh, two, two versions of hotel or motel use, correct? Correct. And um, the extended, and yeah, the extended yep. stay. And it seems like in, in a, some time ago, in, a, in a, a review of this, that the whole landscape has changed for the need for hotels and all that kind of stuff. Was that? I mean, that's so. It's it's unlikely that a hotel would be built here, right? I mean, they if yeah. what was being proposed, they just wouldn't go forward with it, right? Right, and the applicant can add more detail to this, but I think it's clear that two hotels, not likely within this development, I believe they're still hopeful uh, for the hotel in the middle, um, but to do two hotels, uh, they would like to change one of those out for yeah. housing. And it's very much, I mean, uh, as a result of the current situation. Right. So, yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Alkire. Do you know uh, how many how many parking stalls are in that ramp total? Oh, total in the ramp. I mean, just, no, no. How, I know how many they're using from the in in the ramp, but I'm just curious 
Are the 93 spaces that they're counting on to use in the ramp for the apartment building, is that a significant number, um, a proportion, or, or, or a trivial proportion, yeah, or I, somewhere in the middle? Yeah, I can give you the exact number, but the applicant had set aside 10%. It's a public parking ramp for uses okay. <clears throat> within the entire development, mm -hmm. including that ramp was to be used for the parking for the hotel on the site. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, there's far less need for parking within the deck as was originally proposed compared to a hotel words, you're saying yeah there would have been oh, say 150 stalls required within the parking deck to um, provide parking for the hotel okay. now they're just suggesting 93 okay All right thank you so in a sense there may be more available public parking spaces yeah other questions for staff well, we'll have an opportunity. Again. Oh, Commissioner Olson, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. So I apologize. I missed the sketch plan, and I think you covered this um, in your presentation, Carrie. But again, just did they meet all of the comments that were made? And you know, or I guess I could put that toward the Planning Commission yeah. to see if they. There was a suggestion of adding more green space along the north side of the building, maybe some overstory trees. They weren't able to accomplish that. They and that were. was the one that kind of stuck yeah. out to me is they, they weren't able to meet. Was it at all suggested to like flip everything around so it's more activity and the, you know, it's part of the site, this feels like it's kind of not, it's like facing out of the site? But I don't that did that, did that come that. I don't. I think they're wanting to take advantage of the sun to the south. Yeah, it's a good point. Okay, that's all I had. Thanks. Well, commissioners, we'll have another chance later. I, I'd like to invite the applicant to speak. Uh, just state your name and who you represent, and welcome. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be back before you, not in person tonight, unfortunately. Uh, but we do look forward to being back in person uh, in front of you for some of our future projects in Pentagon Village that we're working on right now. So uh, hopefully that won't be in the, the, it will be in the not too distant future. But uh, my name is Jay Scott. I'm with Solomon Real Estate Group. I'm one of the uh, development partners for the overall Pentagon Village project. And then uh, one of the partners here for this proposed apartment project that uh, we have before you tonight as well. Um, I've got David Stahl joining me as part of the presentation. He's a principal with uh, Cunningham, our project architect, and uh, David's going to kind of walk you through the drawings. Uh, but before he does, I wanted to kind of, I, I guess, maybe respond to a couple of the questions that were pointed out and certainly following the presentation. If you have any questions, we're, we're available to answer those. Um, maybe to begin, I'll just do a high level overview here. Uh, Mr. T did a nice job of kind of just outline uh, some of the historical perspective of perspectives of this project and where we're at. Uh, this particular area of view, you can see the, the yellow highlighted feature there. That is the proposed uh, apartment project that would be replacing the extended stay hotel. Um, the hotel in front of that, one of the comments was, uh, you know, in regards to the hotels, we do have high hopes that that uh, other hotel in the middle of the project is going, going to move forward. Uh, we're hopeful that that will start next summer. So at this point, we're Planning on that hotel being a part of the project, but certainly with uh, COVID and the pandemic uh, and the impacts on the hospitality industry, it didn't make sense to try to put two hotels on the site. Um, so we made the decision to really bring the, the multifamily in. And, and frankly, I think the multifamily actually adds a, a, a benefiting facet that we didn't have before that's really going to activate the site in some different ways than the hotel would have. So uh, I think this is a, a really exciting, positive change for the overall village and really for the entire community because it's going to bring some additional living units uh, within this part of Edina. Uh, there's not a lot in the area, although there's one that was recently approved, as you know, down the street. Uh, and certainly across the street, we have some uh, residential as well. Uh, but right now, this view, uh, there you go, David, you have the, the site plan here. You can kind of see the different lots. Uh, we've got five lots for vertical development on the site. We've accomplished the first piece with the two small retail buildings out in front. Uh, the hotel will be the second piece in the middle of the site there on lot two. Uh, this apartment building would be then on lot three highlighted in yellow. And then we've got a, a restaurant that we're working with for lot four that uh, hopefully we'll be in front of you shortly with. Uh, and then, of course, sort of our signature office component along the freeway on lot five that we're working on uh, right now as well. So in spite of COVID and some of the setbacks with that, 
we're very excited about the future of this project. And uh, I think it's just going to really come together here over the course of the next, you know, 12 to 18 months as we kind of get out of the pandemic and we start to see some real strong activity and interest in this particular site. Um, so, uh, uh, one other thing I just wanted to touch on, there was a question on the parking. Uh, before we let David just kind of walk through the plan, I'll just walk through the parking very briefly. So the existing parking garage has three levels and it's, there are 423 stalls in those three levels. We have the ability to expand the ramp up to six levels for 861 stalls. And the expansion of the ramp really is to accommodate the uh, office building component on lot five. The 423 stalls is to serve the hotel and what was to be the second hotel, but now the apartment use on lot three. Uh, so we have an abundance of parking in the existing ramp to meet the needs both for the hotel and for this proposed apartment project. Uh, and as Carrie mentioned, uh, the hotel actually required more accessible parking in the ramp than what we're having to do here because we're actually putting the majority of our parking for the apartment project below the building itself on the site. So uh, it actually has a positive impact in freeing up additional parking uh, for the public or for some of the other components in the future uh, for the village project. So with that, uh, I won't belabor anything here. We can come back and answer any questions you have, David. Maybe you can uh, take it from here and just kind of walk us through the plan a little bit, and then we'll uh, answer any questions that you may have. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you, Commission, for uh, having us back and um, allowing us to explain how we've furthered the design. Uh, this is normally where we'd have our landscape architect talk about it, but uh, he's up north and the internet connection was deemed unacceptable. So I'll be stepping in and reading his part. But um, we really wanted to focus on the connection of this building, specifically what is the pedestrian experience? This isn't a standalone building off somewhere. It's part of a larger picture. So. When we were looking at the landscape design, we wanted to look at how we can integrate into the surrounding context of Pentagon Village and the surrounding parks and trails, creating opportunities to engage with the local Richards Park and providing access to the Nine Mile Creek bike trail. Uh, the appreciation of local arts and arts is also a major component of Pentagon Village. So to further that, we have um, it's a fundamental part of our site design. The current design creates an opportunity to have four very unique and distinct edges that mirrors its surroundings. The southern side, or we'll just term it the park view, is the most quiet and park-like that allows for residents to leisurely take walks, enjoy terrace landscapes, and uh, a big opportunity for pollinator-filled planting zones. The eastern edge, or as we're terming it, out and about, creates multiple active spaces for dog owners with a dog run along the out, uh, along the side, an outdoor patio outside of our um, hobby lounge, and connected to um, that lounge, there's access for bike uh, acts. Uh, our bike room is associated with it, so we can get in and out on that side, or they can also access their bike parking from inside the garage. The northern side is our urban edge, which is our city uh, streetscape. It creates a unique pedestrian experience with multiple art installations with the use of murals and sculptures. It is also defined by vertical vines, some upright evergreens, raised planters with integrated seating for the art installations. The, to address quickly the question about some, uh, some cover story trees, our landscape architect thinks they'll do fine across the north side of uh, Pentagon Village Drive, but on this south side, it would be very close to the building and shaded, and we wanted to keep that more urban feel that aligns with the existing parking ramp, so the street has a consistent feel along that side. We do want to make it enjoyable, but in different ways. Um, then lastly, the west side of the plaza creates an extension towards the existing Central Park. Um, and uh, it highlights the entry for new residents. It has a hotel like drop off. Um, we want to use multiple pavement patterns and areas to designate walking, parking and driving. So this side, um, the landscape plan is designated designed uh, with the intent to use native plantings, enhance the existing tree canopy, 
can create pollinator friendly landscapes, creating uh, drifts of perennials along the south edge purposely enhances the park view walk while using native grasses and flowers are integral throughout the entire campus. The overall planting design looks to use reds, purples, and oranges to accent the building while providing additional habitat for butterflies, birds, and bees. If there are any specific questions about the plants, I'll have to defer. <laughs> All right, moving on to the exterior. Uh, we did listen to uh, the comments. We discussed orientation. We also discussed um, uh, materials, uh, specifically noting not to have too many, to use them wisely. So we wanted a contemporary look to fit with a planned vernacular of the rest of Pentagon Village. We wanted it contemporary, but we didn't want it trendy. The shape of the plan naturally emphasizes the corners. So we built that up by uh, increasing the uh, detail, articulation, and color. The corner, um, between the corners, simplifying it, we went with uh, a simple pattern of the grid and a bit more subdued colors. Uh, so your eyes naturally go to the corners. We added some wood tones for that sense of warmth and liveliness. We have a number of balconies on all sides to keep it active and people can go outside not only for the uh, residents' enjoyment, but it activates and makes the um, more neighborhood feel more lively when there are that type of things. The ground floors have active spaces. We're looking right now at the, which will be the lobby, which has a uh, waiting area and business center, uh, work from home like uh, area, fitness, and uh, as mentioned before, a nice drop off. On the far corner, we also have that activated with that other uh, use of our hobby uh, space. And along the north edge, the lowest level to contain the parking comes out to uh, uh, hold the street line that aligns with the other parking structure. But we wanted to give areas of breaks for art and other elements. And we pushed back the center wing back a bit to give some relief so it wasn't just a straight down to the corner along that whole walk. Uh, Carrie had pointed out the uh, uh, amenity plaza that covers up a lot of the parking. So all the parking within the building isn't seen. They only have the drop off and the next door parking ramp, um, which is also covered. This is our quiet side where we can uh, have a lot of the pollinator plantings. Um, it is oriented with the open plaza to the south specifically for uh, sun. Uh, our plaza design continues to evolve and will, but somewhere on it will be a pool, grill stations, uh, fire pits, areas for uh, beanbag toss, that sort of thing. Uh, a little bit of uh, a space to enjoy the area. Here's a shot of our uh, dog area. Of course, people can go into the neighborhood and uh, take their dogs for walks to the many parks, but sometimes at 1030 at night, it's nice to have an area that's designated specific secure. We are also going to have planters around it and a fence so um, drivers by it's aesthetically pleasing. Uh, materials, uh, we want uh, to have enough to add interest but not so many to seem busy. We have uh, masonry along the base and then at the entries we have uh, a bit more articulation with the wood tones coming up designated the corners. Most of it is uh, metals. The wood could be a cementitious printed or um, a product, uh, I'll use its trade name, longboard, which is an aluminum extrusion that has a wood print. Be great to use real wood, but uh, it just doesn't hold up for the, the years that we need. And uh, some minimal use of some hardy panel to give a, a stucco-like look. And of course, I'm happy to return to any specific questions you may have. Uh, a brief run through of the layout. We have our drop off. If you're a first time resident, you'd park in the short term guest parking here. Our front door, which looks toward the central uh, park plaza area. Um, come in, there's a lobby with uh, management offices, 
some areas, some work from home Zoom rooms, uh, because sometimes you just need to get out of your apartment and do a little bit of work. We have a fitness room with yoga and uh, your standard mail. We have a large trash room indoor, a separate move in uh, on this side. So uh, when you're unloading, they don't have to go through the front door. This is our secure parking, as mentioned. Uh, while we do have ample parking in the ramp next door, uh, there are some residents that specifically uh, won't live in a place that doesn't have secure parking within uh, the perimeter. So we're accommodating that. We have our hobby room. We're calling it a hobby room because it's like a bike lounge in that there are bike storage. You can work on your bike, but you might need to frame a picture, drill a hole, do some crafting. Uh, it's an area to do some hands-on things. Along with bike storage, uh, which we have 64, by the way, um, that's three times the requirement. We also have storage lockers for other things like perhaps a snowboard, skis, golf bags. We want this to be a multi-use area. There is a pet wash and a bike rinse area here if need be. Bikes can come in this side or through the door. And here's our dog run, which has is right outside an exit uh, and for, convenience. On the upper level, we have um, just all of our units. We have one club room that activates our plaza deck. And like I mentioned, the design is continuing, but the idea is uh, it's, a, it's the heart of the community that lives here. Um, a big aspect is this is a modular building. Uh, it's one of our uh, main things that contributes to a lot of its sustainability aspect and uh, will minimize disruption on the site. Uh, things that are positive about it is all of the deliveries for wood, uh, electrical boxes, light fixtures, you name it, come to their facility, not on to site. So uh, minimizes the amount of traffic to the neighborhood. Everything happens here. They are delivered on site complete uh, and by complete appliances are in the kitchen, carpet is laid, light fixtures are in place. Um, it's also very uh, energy uh, efficient and that's to make sure they can travel. Some things are be beefed up. So exterior walls are two by eights instead of two by six, which allows for greater insulation. Uh, this is also under these controlled circumstances. There's very little waste due to weather um, or damage, and they can track uh, the amount of items going to landfills and make sure that they're optimizing every bit of usable material they have. Um, some comments that were made uh, by the city, specifically uh, in the report, where um, what are we doing for heat island effect? We will be having a high reflectance uh, roof, which is uh, white or light gray. Um, we are looking and investigating actively on uh, solar panels. If it is economically viable, it's something we're very interested in. That also goes along with solar ready. Uh, that's a minimal impact to the building. You only need to have space for future transformers and conduit. Something again that uh, it's very interested and we continue to look at and we'll incorporate everything we can do. Um, also uh, considering purchasing uh, renewable energy credits if that's viable. Um, another thing in the report that was a, a big item that we'd like to touch on is uh, EV charging for cars. Uh, it was recommended that 5% are wired uh, with a possibility for 10. We think this is going to be a need very soon. So we're going to put in and actively have five to 10% active and have 50% uh, wired ready to go as soon as it's um, needed. In other words, if a resident wants it, it's ready to go. And then we are also, um, future proofing for 100%, assuming at the, it's going to be here. We'll make sure we have room for the transformers and the electrical room, or not transformers, excuse me, panels, uh, that sort of thing. So that's a, that's a, a big thing that we uh, are going to incorporate, as well as the uh, car share program. 
we will look into that. Whether it's better served within the building or if we uh, house it next door in the parking ramp, designate some stalls there so not only our residents, but perhaps someone from the hotel or other office thing could use it. Um, that's something we're going to consider as well. We'll look for the best place for that. Um, I will walk. I won't walk through all of these items. I'll just hit some of the highlights. But uh, as I mentioned, the modular construction reduces construction time on site by 30 to 50 percent. That'll be really nice for uh, the neighborhood. Um, the energy consumption, uh, having it all indoors, we don't need to put in temporary heat or ventilation or that sort of thing while it's under construction. Um, we will be following the uh, benchmark reporting through the uh, efficient building system, uh, excuse me, if efficient building benchmarking ordinance, your city uh, requirement. Um, we're well insulated with all LED lights um, and uh, uh, other items I wanted to mention were uh, the 10% affordable units, and um, we have a lot of room in our trash room, so we're uh, also considering organic recycling. There's a lot of items there. I'd love to talk in more detail, but I'll let you ask the specifics and we'll answer those questions. But uh, I think this will make a lovely component and bring a few, uh, 24 seven life into this corner of Edina and uh, look forward to your feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stahl. Planning commissioners, anyone with uh, questions for the applicant? Commissioner Miranda. Um, so on the north side um, is the um, you can see a view from the top. Yeah, the yep. Oh, uh, this is north, south. north side. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, so it looks like um, from other diagrams that the sidewalk is right up against the curb, and that the green space is actually between the building and the sidewalk. Is that true? It is. Uh, I, we do have a plan. Here you can see um, the sidewalk is along the curb. As per the rest of uh, this Pentagon Village Street, it isn't named yet, so we're calling that for uh, tonight's meeting. But uh, that's that uh, aligns and follows the design set by the block to the west. Um, we've got six to eight feet in width, depending on its undulations. We have uh, a raised planter that has built-in seats and little art niches. Um, to activate and punctuate the walk along that side. This is our city kind of feeling edge. Our more green and softer are around the others. Okay, so um, so the, uh, but it's basically, so, so what are those, so the red dots are the art, is that it? it placeholders for yeah. uh, a location, yeah, correct. Okay. Um, but the rest of it is basically the wall of parking. Right, so there, there's no, there's no, are there windows into the parking or anything? We're looking at some frosted windows to add some light, a few of them, but also looking at some green walls that would be uh, obviously shade, tolerant vines and things and uh, murals to break that up. We want it to be active and lively, but since there isn't any commercial or anything in this and we needed to get a certain amount of parking in, uh, we're doing our best to articulate it from the outside. Okay, and then to get uh, from the bike parking to the Nine Mile Creek Trail, what is the, you know, obvious way of getting there? Route. So we have that. They can either go up Computer Drive and cross at 77th. There's a crossing at that intersection. Or... The route that we'd like them to take would be to go through the site and go by the, the built plaza and there's this other signal intersection. Right now, the connection at this point uh, is in the process of becoming more public. <laughs> I think there's a few little last steps, but uh, hopefully by the time the residents are here, all of that is worked out. 
Okay. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit just to let you know those conversations are actively involved right now with 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 Perry over Park and Rack and also with uh, Three Rivers. So we're working with those groups to uh, really activate the access point from Pentagon Village into the trail system. Okay, and then um, I was here and was part of the commission when, whoop, go back. <laughs> oh, okay, yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I've since gone back and taken pictures of, of, of this place and to confirm it. But so the, actually the path that you're showing doesn't really exist. So um, if you want to, so if you come in from um, 77th Street to the northern edge of your, uh, of the development, then as you show on the west side, there's a, there's a sidewalk um, or that, Pedestrians or, or bicycles can use so the green dotted line on the on the entrance from 77th Street, right there. Yeah, right. Yeah. But that does not continue down to the plaza. So you've got to cross the street at the end of that first little leg, and then yep. So right so here. yeah. So there you've got to cross, not down. You got to cross to the right, mm. to the east, and then you go down. Yes, yep. And then you have to cross again to get to the park. So it's kind of a convoluted way of getting there, I'm saying. So um, unless it gets re retrofitted. All right. Um, and then they have to go along. I mean, you're not really showing it, but they're going along. So the bicycle parking is on the northeast corner of your uh, project location. So they've got to bike along that wall of just the parking thing. Well, there's actually... There. There are locations for, for bike access on both the northwest and northeast corners. So depending okay. upon where they're parking their, their bike, they may uh, be on the northwest corner very close to the central park and be able to come out the garage right in that particular area. Or, or we have surface biking stalls or racks right in that area as well. So okay. I would envision they would actually come up uh, potentially alongside the hotel and not even cross the street to the plaza. So not reflective of what this green line is showing, and then just take the natural crosswalks all the way to the intersection. There's a crosswalk right there at 77. They can cross right over there, and that's probably where the trail connection will be made. So one of our partners in Pentagon Village owns that property to the right of that green line, uh, and therefore we do have access uh, to the real estate, if you will, to help facilitate making that trail connection a possibility or a reality. Okay, but yeah, but the. The hardest part is actually going through your village, but anyway. Um, okay, so uh, let's see, we have another question here. Um, no, that was it, all right, thank you. Any other commissioners? Commissioner Bennett. Yeah, thanks for the <clears throat> presentation. I guess just to build on some of Commissioner Miranda's points, uh, can you speak I guess specifically regarding the bike, uh, are the two locations in the northeast and northwest, is, are those for residents only or are any of the interior things for guests or is all that reserved for outdoor bike parking and where is that actually located? The uh, interior bike parking is specifically for residents. Um, We've had a number of discussions with our management group about what could be open and what closed and security is a big selling point of, for the residents. So we have bike parking outside at this point if they want to come in the store or our main area, we have a field over there. We're only required to have 10 that we can accommodate much more. Uh, we have space uh, for more than that. So. We can find what what is the appropriate load and levels and we're happy uh, to accommodate as for the comings and going they can either come out this door here and there's a ramp down or of course they could go right through um, the driveway and out depending on the comfort of the biker sure i think it's also important to note that we do have bike racks in the central plaza um, we have them um, you know, we will plan to have them uh, as part of the office building as well. So there will be public bike uh, racks and parking available for bikes uh, throughout Pentagon Village. So we're, we're going to certainly, with the apartments, provide uh, ample bike rack uh, use for, for the public or for the residents. 
but within the overall project, there's going to be a number of points where they're going to be able to access bike racks as well. Great, thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a small piece to this big puzzle, but just thinking of guests that are coming to visit the people here, because there will be a lot of people there, just that process and where is it easy for them to get to, you know, if they're new to the area, what makes sense. So as long as there's enough room and it looks like you have areas reserved, that's good. It's just I'd like to see it more, I guess, enhanced, kind of like maybe what Commissioner Miranda was referring to. All right, second question I have was kind of about the same type of thing with the parking garage wall on the north side, and I'll get into that later. But um, I know you showed from the renderings that the building steps in at least above that level. Um, how far does it step in? Is, is that it right there? We've got about eight feet. So eight feet. And from this edge, this goes out another four, so that would be 12 from the farthest point. But then we have pulled it back a little bit to give a little bit more breathing space along that art walk. Um, and then we do have articulation back into these areas where the wings connect. And so that white space, is that serving spray. as a patio space for those residents, or is that correct? There will be access in certain areas and patios, but it won't be a come walk along the front. They'll probably be designated uh, fences and rails to keep people in front of their own units. Okay. Yeah, I guess, I guess just, yeah, and I'll, I'll get into my comments later, but um, I know that was something I brought up or other people did too, just about enhancing that north side a little better and... I, I guess, have you looked, did you look into other things aside from, you know, a big tall wall that's just along that whole face? The, we did discuss shifting it back uh, a bit. We wanted to make sure our elevators stayed within our lobby, but most of the discussion kept coming back to, uh, instead of having two, um, two amenity sides, this would be more along the line of private balcony seating plaza, but really keep all of our uh, efforts, get critical mass on this uh, plaza side that's south facing in the sun with a pool. Thanks. Yeah, there's, I mean, a lot I like about the proposal. I, I think one of the things that I struggle with the most is how it connects to the rest of the puzzle. And it just seems like that north side has a lot more opportunity that is being completely ignored almost. Um, if I, I get it with a hotel, but if there is going to be a restaurant nearby, there's ways to, I mean, it's like the parking on site here could be minimized like you're already using the ramp next door. Um, you know, if that restaurant's really popular, there could be spillover seating across the street if there was space for it. But it seems like we're kind of handcuffed away from that. And I guess it just makes the, the next proposals, whatever whatever happens there, that much more important. But uh, thanks for your explanation. That's all I have right now. Thank you, Commissioner Bennett. Other commissioners? Commissioner Agnew, do you have anything? Sure. In a, in a lot of ways, I want to just echo and double down on what Commissioner um, Bennett just said. Like, I can imagine living in an area like this and wanting to be fully immersed within this village, being able to walk over to, you know, that co-working space that I know is, is nearby there and, and really engage. And right now it, it does feel walled off in a way. Um, and so I don't know what the right answer is. You know, I really do understand wanting to capture as much of that sunlight as possible. I don't know if it means, you know, and I'm not the designer, right? But like taking out some of the units to, to kind of squish that a little bit and give more of that entryway on the other side. I just really wanna make sure that, that the people who live here are really immersing in this localized community that I would love to see build up around this. David, can you put up the site plan of the overall project? And maybe I can speak to the connectivity because 
these are great comments and questions that you're you're raising. There are points that you're raising, um, and I do want you to know that we've, you know, we've we've paid a lot of attention to the design of this to make sure it does connect very well to the overall whole of the project. Uh, so that experience needs to be positive not only for the residents but for the visitors and the other people that are are participating and coming to Pentagon Village. So. Um, do we have one, David, a site plan that shows this project more specifically rather than the height? Um, maybe we don't. Um, that was the graphic from before. Apologize that this wasn't put in. Well, maybe go um, back to the one you had previously. Sorry. Okay. Um, Sorry. So I just, so we've, if you look, if this doesn't reflect within the yellow, the actual building layout, unfortunately, but um, the, the two corners, the northwest and the northeast corner of the project have been activated with entrance points into the building and, and a lot of uh, windows and a lot of activation there. So that was intentional so that we are connecting to the plaza, to the parking ramp, facing the office building, even to some degree the retail up in that corner. Uh, on the northeast corner, we are connecting to that future restaurant pad as well. So part of the excitement of this project is that restaurant and vice versa, because it's gonna interact very nicely with one another with a lot of outdoor dining space associated with the restaurant as well. Um, but we have activated that corner to connect to that as well. So the kind of the wall concern that you have, most of that is really, you know, taking place adjacent to the hotel. And that's a pretty substantial structure in front of it there as well. So this is gonna be an urban edge uh, as we've talked about, but it is designed with a very high level uh, of, of really hardscape treatment, if you will, the planters, the, the art components. Um, so it's it's uh, it's going to be a beautiful urban walk, if you will, and that's intentional. It's not going to be a wall. There's a lot of articulation there, probably more so than comes across, you know, in reality. And just quickly looking at these plans, because uh, we do set back pretty substantially in different areas throughout that. So there isn't just a singular wall between these two corner pieces. There's a, a substantial amount of articulation, both at the pedestrian level and even at the second story level. Uh, so you're gonna you're gonna get a strong feel with architecture, but you're not gonna feel like you're walking next to a wall there. Um, so that that was an important component, and it may not come across as easily. You know, we've had you know millions of these discussions, of course, internally. So we're very familiar with where we're going with this design. It's a little bit harder, I think, to see on some of these graphics. You know, the what I think the reality is going to be for that particular space and. Um, I, I think we maybe could have had a graphic that would have shown a pedestrian view a little bit better there and it might have given a better indication of what that experience might otherwise be. Yeah, I was going to say the the same of we we're just getting started. We're getting input. This rendering is showing the side. Now that we know that this is an important area, you can bet our next renderings will show it. And we want to make sure that yes, it isn't just a straight shot. There are those art areas are going to be quite enjoyable and designed and interesting. And there are balconies above this setback and activation. So we we, we hope to show you that uh, this will be a delightful walk on all sides throughout the whole village. Thanks, I guess, you know, I was hoping to see that tonight, right? I mean, this isn't a sketch plan tonight, correct? This is this is the final so it, it's hard to you know put trust in that not seeing it right now so I, I mean I totally respect where you're coming from but I've I mean a lot of us have been places where you walk alongside a wall and you're tight roping a grass little space I mean there's only so many ways to make that enjoyable or interface with what's across and I, I just have serious reservations there again and I'll get into my comments later, but I just wanted to understand why that was not addressed more. Um, it, it does feel like the east and the south side of this are the best experience, and that's the perimeter of the whole village, which to me seems opposite of what you'd want to achieve for a village and a community. So I was hoping to see something a little different, and I, I guess that's just where I'm at. So thanks. And then, um, Commissioner Agnew, did you have further questions? No, I just wanted that part of it addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? So uh, I had a couple of things, Mr. Scott, Mr. Stahl. Um, 
I think I talked about this with Planner T before, but Seagate. Are there any issues with Seagate that have come up? I guess that's a question for Planner T and the applicant. Seagate has not reached out to us in regards to this project. They did with the Pentagon North site, but they have not with this one. Um, I guess I have the applicant too. Have you had any communications with Seagate at all? or? We have not, no. We, we did hold a neighborhood meeting had uh, very low attendance. So, you know, we're, we're not really next to immediate neighborhoods. We did get a couple of, of phone calls with interested parties, um, you know, with properties surrounding the area that, you know, we're obviously supportive and excited with what's going on and wanting to see all of this occur. But uh, we did not hear specifically from Seagate uh, during this process. Okay, and, and, and the, the reason I'm asking is just because in the past, Seagate has raised certain issues with developments that occur near, near within a certain number of feet of their property and that have caused stress. So I don't, you know, I guess, I, yeah, I guess we'll just move on. Uh, then I had questions about parking. Um, two questions, and these are as much theoretical as anything, but um, you have two different types of parking availabilities to your tenants it looks like in this property are there are there different charges depending on which type of parking a tenant elects the below grade enclosed parking would likely have a fee associated with it so there would be a rental fee for that for use of the no stalls there is no cost for using the parking of the ramp okay and then an even more theoretical thank you for that answer Mr. Scott, be more theoretical. This is kind of a mixed use facility. Are you finding in general, like if you had taken all these uses and built them separately and they'd have one, you know, they, they'd have an, add, you know, you'd add up all the parking requirements for them, but because this is kind of a mixed use, are you, are you finding that you can ha successfully have less parking because of the combination of uses? Uh, yes, actually substantially less parking um, and that that's by design. So the overall project was designed with the densities that you saw on the earlier graphics uh, and we did a full shared parking analysis with uh, the various traffic consultants, both the city consultant and our private consultant to determine, you know, the amount of parking that potentially would be needed between the different uses. So strategically we are applying different uses here at the site that are going to have needs for parking at different hours, different peak periods. Um, and so, you know, really the hotel uh, and the apartment building are going to be using the parking uh, at about the same time, predominantly. Uh, and that's why we need to make sure we have sufficient parking in the ramp uh, to support any of the needs off, off of the sites uh, to meet those requirements. And we do. We, we have an, uh, an abundance still in the ramp to support other elements within the village, including public parking. Uh, and as I mentioned before, once the office component starts, uh, that ramp will be expanded uh, in, in order to meet the needs then of the office users as well. Do you, and, and uh, you, you may, the answer may be, you, uh, you don't know the answer. The, the answer to this question may be, I don't know, but is there any kind of like rough rule of thumb that you can say with this kind of mixed use that reduces your parking requirements, say 10%, 20%, 30% or do you have any kind of guesstimate on that? I, I can't really guess as to what that is. We, we know, you know, naturally that it exists. I'm not sure I could quantify that. Um, certainly, I think as we go forward with future components here, that'll be a big part of the, the approval process and understanding how the parking is going to work for all of these different components. Um, and probably the, you know, Lincoln Associates or one of the traffic consultants will, will do that analysis uh, in part with us. There are standardized uh, car sharing things. Unfortunately, it becomes quite a mathematical formula to figure it out. So it isn't as easy as a 15 or 20, but there is a standardized way to calculate it. Um, and like I said, uh, if we asked any of our consultants, we could find that out. All right. Well, thank you. And, and obviously, you know, you you're you figured out what would be appropriate for you for this facility that to take a reduction from what you would have if you had a bunch of single developments. So um, this is a public hearing, as we said before, the people in the room can speak 
can you know we'll open this up for public comment now and people in the room can come forward and speak and people on the phone can also call in uh, each person will have up to three minutes identify yourself uh, your address if you call in give the operator your phone number people in the room will have the first chance people that call in will then have speak after anyone in the room um, people on the phone if you'd like to call in or people listening, here's the information to call in to give testimony. 1-800-374-0221, conference ID 4164856. Press star 1 and then give your name, number, and uh, address to the operator and you'll be placed into queue. So with that, is there anyone in the room that would like to give some testimony? Welcome. Welcome. Good evening. This is Steve Brown. I live at 5528 Halifax Lane. It's nice to see all of you, Chair and Commissioners. It's nice to see you in person rather than just on the video, which I was watching earlier before I arrived tonight. I want to speak in favor of this project. And the reason is simple. This provides 20 units for people who are earning 50% AMI or less. I think all of you are aware that it's very difficult to get affordable housing. It is more difficult, obviously, to get affordable housing for folks at 50% AMI and lower. Most affordable housing starts at 80%, and from there, it tends to drop off rather quickly. So it's nice to see somebody coming forward with a proposal to build at least 20 units at 50% AMI, or for people at 50% AMI. So for that reason, and for that reason alone, I support this project. There are many other, obviously, positive aspects about this project, but I think that is particularly compelling in my case. So I urge you to support this particular project. I think it provides a type of housing that we need. In the comp plan, we identified a need for 480 of these units. This is 20. For the year, we would expect to get about 48. It's already... July, it's unlikely we're going to see another proposal that will actually make it through this year. So we'll get 20 out of our need for 48 units this year from this project. So again, for that reason, I encourage you to support this project. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Anyone else in the room tonight would like to speak? Anyone else? On the phone, who'd like to speak? We've given you the number. Mr. Riesig, do we have anyone who? We do have one caller in queue right now, so if the operator can unmute the line of Lori Groats. And Lori, please uh, state your name and address for the record. Thank you. At Pentagon South was built with TIF dollars and I'm wondering about the appropriateness of using the apartment, to having the apartment owner using parking in that ramp. I don't think that's an appropriate use of TIF. I remember for the overflow for the office park for parking, it was supposed to be parking for residents that were going to walk over to Fred Richards, but I don't think that it would have been approved for use of TIF by providing parking for an apartment building. My second point is about sustainability. My question to the developer is, how are you going to be softening the water in your apartment building? Are you going to be using salt or will you be using lime? The city is building a lot of apartment buildings, and I have called a few of the larger complexes, and I've asked them how they're handling the softening of the water for their apartment buildings. And I've been told salt. They're trucking in salt. The Metropolitan Wastewater Treatment does not remove chloride from the water. So we're polluting lakes and streams and rivers. All the chloride is going into the public waters. Chloride never breaks down. It only gets diluted. Uh, 
our surrounding communities have chosen to soften their water for residents so that they're not polluting the water. Richfield's been softening their water for almost 60 years, Bloomington almost 50 years. When I called Eden Prairie, um, the person in public works told me I've worked in public works for 30 years and I've never needed a water softener here. So the city has chosen not to soften the water with lime, but each apartment owner has the option of making a decision how they're going to be softening their water. Are you going to be using salt or are you going to be using lime? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gross. Mr. Riesig, do we have anyone else? We do not have any other callers. If we want to wait about 30 seconds or so, just to give them a chance to catch up, I'll let you know. No additional callers, so feel free to move forward. Thank you. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? Move to close the public hearing. Is there a second? I will second that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote, please? Commissioner Miranda. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Elkire. Aye. Commissioner Bartling. Aye. Commissioner Strauss. Aye. Commissioner Bennett. Aye. Commissioner Agnew. Aye. Chair Nemrod. Chair. Aye. So, uh, before we bring up the planning commission discussion, I'd like to just follow up on some of the comments we received from uh, the public feedback. Uh, Planner Teague, we received a comment about affordable housing at 50% AMI. Is there any, I, I know we also, I, I saw something from uh, the city affordable housing director, Ms. Hawkinson about this. Is there anything further to just say about that or? Uh, nothing further. This would, this will definitely help our case in achieving built affordable housing units. Okay. Um, back to you, Planner Teague. Uh, <laughs> and, and maybe this is, maybe this is, uh, maybe uh, like we had a quick comment come in, came in about use of TIF for the parking for the apartment. Could you, I mean, uh, I know you're not the TIF person in Edina, but you're the, maybe the best person in the room tonight. Could you comment on that? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, Yet it is true that TIF was utilized for this project. Um, that said, given the change in the use and the change in the parking, there will likely be a, a change to that TIF agreement. So um, economic development manager Bill Neuendorf is working with the applicant. Um, ultimately, in the end, it, if there is a, a change, and I believe there will be, it's a decision of the city council. So it is something that we're looking at. I just don't know the exact answer tonight. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna stay with you also. We got we received a question about softening water and then I might go to the applicant too. But um, what is the city's position on it? I mean, uh, and I mean, does the city have any requirements uh, for private developers regarding how they soften water? Not that I am aware of, so I, that's probably a question for the applicant. I'm not aware of any city requirements. Mr. Scott, I'll just ask you, I mean, how you, what, you, what you're planning to do for water softening. Well, to be honest, I'd love to answer the question on the parking and the parking ramp. <laughs> Defer well, the question to mm -hmm. David Stahl, because I frankly don't know how we're going to be softening the water. That's not a comment or a question that we've had internally. But um, maybe, David, you can answer that. And then if I can, I can come back. I wanted to offer a comment related to the parking before we move on. Great, sounds this is great. the first time, thank you. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been asked about the softener specifically at this early stage. I uh, texted, the, um, as soon as that question came up, I texted my mechanical engineer. I'll see if he gets back to me, <laughs> but I don't know either. Okay, Mr. Scott. Right, well, yeah, jump back on the parking just for a moment here and maybe provide a little bit of clarity just from a historical perspective. So the, the parking ramp was 
integrated as part of this project to support density for development here within Pentagon Village. So rather than see a parking, we needed to consolidate the parking. Uh, we weren't able to do it with the high water table level, you know, beneath all of the different parcels uh, that were, were to be developed within the project. So the logical, uh, you know, option was to build vertical and build a parking ramp. So part of the TIF was used for that. And it was all privately funded. You all understand how TIF you know, operates. So it's a payback as you go, as we generate increment, we'll get reimbursed for some of that cost, but everything's been privately financed to date. Um, and that ramp is was intended to support the office, the hotels or the hotel and the apartment building, and even residually some of the overflow from the restaurants and the retail spaces. So uh, we have a parking facilities agreement with the city there is a public access component to that parking ramp so the public can use it, but it is not for the public's primary purpose to use that ramp. It, the, the ramp's primary purpose rather is to support uh, the development and the need uh, for the different uses within Pentagon Village. So I think you know, to the caller's point, the concern uh, of apartments using that, um, that's just not you know, accurate in that sense because the apartments, the hotels, all of these different parcels were fully intended to use that parking ramp as, as part of meeting their parking component. Thank you, Mr. Scott. And I guess I have a follow-up question for Mr. Teague again. And that I, I guess is that, that that issue might be more relevant to the console. Is that fair? You're, you're, it sounds like you're working on it, Mr. Scott has some comments. It's not a land use thing as we've been taught over the years on the planning commission but is that more of a council issue that is true that's more for the city council so <clears throat> we'd invite Ms. Ms. Groats if she wants to bring that issue up again if and when this matter goes before council correct okay well I think that's all the my follow-up to the public hearing if anyone else has any please share otherwise this opportunity now for planning commission to make commentary did, did you Commissioner Bennett I had a follow-up to something you said just to clarify for the public tuning in but this project does have a requirement to achieve some of the affordable housing it's just it doesn't necessarily need to be on site for this particular project 20% of the units will be on site yep so yeah that would that would get or written 10% but 20 yep. units sorry yes 10% of the units 20 units total yeah. Okay. Otherwise, I mean, they have the option to pay into the Correct. fund for affordable housing. But I just want to make it clear there is a requirement for some commitment to affordability. That's correct. Anyone else with comments, motions, additional questions for you want clarification or? Commissioner uh, Wilson. I just follow up with some of the comments that have been made. Um, I really feel that this doesn't fit. You know, it doesn't. It's not part of the overall PUD. It's just kind of like its own separate building facing out. And I don't like that the fact that there isn't you know more pedestrian connectivity throughout and focused on the center of the site. So I understand you want the self. You know. Uh, what am I trying to say? It's late. <laughs> it's ten ten. But you know that orientation for the plaza and the pool. But I just you know we approved this as a PUD to all work together, and I just feel like it's starting to become piecemeal. And I um, again I apologize I wasn't here for the the sketch plan, but um, you know I think you really need to do something to really make this a little bit more internalized and for the whole site and be a whole piece of the whole site. But that's just my comment. Okay. Also I wanted to add, I love the housing. So, you know, it's hard for me because I think the affordable housing is awesome and at 50%, that's just incredible. So it's hard for me, but I just don't, I think they could still do that, but have the plan really be part of the whole PUD. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Strauss. Perhaps just kind of um, follow up on, on Commissioner Olson's comment about it wasn't part of the plan. I guess as I look at it, and I and I I think there's kind of been a failure 
and this project is at southern boundary. It happens to be a municipal boundary, but the concept, concept of the village, to me, could very well be the freeway, you know, 494, and that, that southern exposure, I think, opens, and I don't know why we should turn, have a wall, just because it's Bloomington. So I think the, the idea of it being, having a southern face, and there's some, I think, parcels you know, to the south, which really get omitted from any plan, that will be very much complementary to the long-term development of this project. So that's why I, I that southern look, I, I kind of will make that Viking drive, I think, much more appealing. And pull, I mean, Morningside is half Minneapolis, Half Edina, you know we, you know we don't, we don't turn our back. But you know when I think over at Xerxes and 66, we have in fact created sort of a wall to Richfield. I mean on, on whatever that frontage road, uh, Vincent. You know I mean uh, the, the, to me it seems it's very much we stopped our view, kind of short-sighted, saying, yeah, that's not us. So that that that, that to me that I see this village as being more than just better got property. Okay, that's just kind of following up on that. Thanks. Yeah, I, for me, I think that I've, there was definitely a lot of improvements um, in, in the overall design. I also agree that in general, the self-facing, if with that, the amenities, that's going to be the right direction to get the sun and especially with our weather. Um, you know, you want to take full advantage of that. What I do have concerns with, though, is, and I do appreciate the the suburbanity, I'll call this, um, because it is has some urban ideas. But again, this is um, not fully urban, so we have to consider that at a higher level. And I think um, with everyone's comments that have been made tonight and approaching it in a way, and it is... <laughs> you know, to Commissioner Olson's point, it's hard to really look at this when it's a single unit because this will set the precedent for the village and how things will interact with each other and what things will look like perhaps. Um, so if we start to just turn our back a little bit on that, um, you know, because there, I think that there's a lot of opportunities on that north side to tie back to the village. Um, we're start, You're starting to do that with a second level balcony um, and some balconies in, in that direction. But I think, you know, taking some cues off of, you know, even what some of the le the more residential neighborhoods of New York City or San Francisco, they are building, you know, pergolas of, of vines and flowers over the sidewalk to create tunnels um, and green space and breaking up the blacktop or the hardscape um, and really t creating those pathways and I guess things of beauty um, versus you know just having all the hardscapes and and different things like that. So I guess that because and again I I do applaud a lot of the things you are doing with this with the with uh, the modular and also the um, affordable housing. Um, but you know where does that leave us? Because this is a final <laughs> review, so. Anyone down on this end? Commissioner Agnew also, would you? Sure, sure, I'll speak. Um, you know, ultimately there's, there's so much that I love about this. I love the affordable housing, the focus on sustainability, the idea that it will be equipped and ready to down the road, be able to support 100% um, electric vehicles is just really cool. Um, the adoption of existing parking um, to meet some of the needs and not making it so that all of the parking is centered within um, the, the complex. Um, and then I think really bringing in housing into this area with everything else that is already there. So I, I really like a lot of this plan. Um, like I said, I, I would like to see it integrated more into this entire village area. Um, but at, at the same time, I don't, 
I don't know what that looks like. And I think that your response to showing some of those those pictures and how there is that entryway and how it, it, it does feed in, I think did alleviate some of those concerns for me. Um, so right now I, I am feeling supportive of this proposal as it was presented tonight. Thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Miranda? Yeah, so as I uh, kind of led on to with my questions, um, I also think the north side is, is really problematic. Um, you know, I guess one way of looking at this project is if you look at the schematics of, of the whole project, uh, the whole village, um, the only thing that really, the only method of transportation that really has ample space <laughs> is the is for cars. So there's plenty of parking. The parking spaces are generously sized. The drive alleys within the parking lots are are wide. You know, it's it's like the parking was designed first, and then you're squeezing buildings and you're squeezing tiny sidewalks. You know, into the sp into whatever space fits left or is left to fit, and. Um, and that's kind of the visualization I'm getting. And I've been there, I've gone there and I've walked around. Um, Cause I had, I would probably complain more than anyone about the original entire project and the way the sidewalks are done, the way pedestrians have to crisscross to, to get to the, to the park. And <clears throat> this doesn't address any of those issues and it just continues to make them as terrible as possible. So I think this is, uh, I love the affordable housing. You know, I'm a big fan of that. I, you know, just wonderful. Um, and as, you know, <clears throat> uh, other commissioners have mentioned, uh, the sustainability part and everything, but the transportation is so key and, you know, we have so many climate issues. We have to get people out of cars. Not everybody's going to get out of a car, but we have to move as many people as we can out of cars. And, and having tiny sidewalks and tiny spaces for bicycles is not the way to do it. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Miranda. Commissioner El Coyote, did you? I don't know. Yeah, it's, I don't. I don't think I have anything. Um, any solutions to offer? But I just thought I would share, I guess, my uncertainty about this, in that we, um, on the one hand, want to. And I think this is to a certain extent what Commissioner Miranda was talking about. On the one hand, we want to consider this an urban environment and a village or a neighborhood um, but the context of this particular piece of land um, and where it sits in relation to residences and businesses in our city um, all by itself this plot of land uh, in my view cannot become a village all by itself I mean, when I look at this, there's just a tremendous amount of service, surface parking, even though I applaud what we've done with shared parking in the ramp. Um, I, I, I agree with what Commissioner Miranda says, and yet I don't know how to fix it, I guess is, <laughs> is my reaction to this. Um, and for me, I mean, I, I think I'm... I, uh, My reaction to the drawings that, I, that we saw tonight, particularly about the north side and the access on the northeast and the northwest of the building, don't trouble me very much. Um, I think the, I like the conversation we're starting to have with the developer around better bike access to uh, the park and by extension to Nine Mile Creek. We're not there yet. But to, to a certain extent, maybe it's naive, I think that the market is going to sort that out because if you get 200 apartments full of bike people and you don't give them a good way to get to Nine Mile Creek, nobody's going to want to live there. So, uh, like I say, that may be a naive perspective, but if I were a developer, I'd sure want to have a good way to get across that street to get to the park if I had a, if I had a building full of bikers. Um, and lastly, uh, to me, the affordable housing piece is key because, you know, there's only so many developments that we can have uh, the developer uh, buy into the fund because at the end of the day, we've got to build some affordable housing units. And, and 
contributing dollars doesn't get us what we need there. It just, I mean, it might someday, but I think we can see from our experience so far that it doesn't happen very fast. Um, I, I don't think we have a, I don't think we have, a, we, I don't think we can credibly say that we can, in a systematic way, turn those dollars into affordable housing units in any time frame, much less within five years or 10 years. I just don't think we know how to do that yet. I'm not saying we won't figure it out, but I don't think we have it figured out yet. Uh, so for me, um, uh, on the affordable housing front, a bird in the hand is worth 10 in the bush. And so that's, that's a, a really important piece of this to me. So like I say, I don't, I'm, it's hard for me to be decisive about this one. Um, and that's probably enough said. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Elkire. Um, I agree with substantially with what Commissioner Elkire said. I think he laid it all the, the pros and oh, uh, Commissioner Agnew, were you waving your hand? I'm sorry. Oh, oh, thinking. Sorry, sorry. One day you'll be here with us, and um, uh, I would take slight exception to Commissioner Elkire. I, I, I'm a little more optimistic on the city's ability to figure out what to do with the dollars it collects from the uh, affordable housing fund, but. Um, but I, I do like the bird in the hands with two in a bush. They're going to come and build them now. And as Mr. Brown commented publicly, I mean, it's at a, it's at a nice AMI rate that's good for us. Um, I, I agree with, um, I believe, with, with Commissioner Bartling. She referred to this as uh, suburbanity. That's probably a, there's probably a term in there someplace. That, um, but that actually is what we did when we agreed to the PUD. We, we, the, the PUD as designed was a, uh, was more suburban than a lot of the uh, goals we wanted elsewhere. Uh, we decided that for a variety of reasons, including the location uh, where this pro these properties are, right at the intersection of two major highways and you know, and you can go back and say, oh, we wish we'd done something different or we didn't, but, but that's, it's already done. This is a sub, sub, suburbanity. This is a suburban, <laughs> suburbane uh, spot already. And um, I share the concerns people have about the orientation of the building, north versus south, or south versus north, excuse me, but um, I'm going to defer to that being the developer's choice. Um, that I'm, you know, and I would, you know, it'd be nice to have more of a village, but it's, you know, it'll work how it's going to work. So, um, I, I support this project, this amendment, and, um, that's kind of where I'm landing. If anyone has follow up comments or questions, please share or otherwise motion. Commissioner Bennett. Not a motion, just comments like I alluded to. So. <clears throat> I feel like I'm a mixed bag of emotions on this one, like everyone up here too. I, I think there's a lot of benefits and there's a lot of stark drawbacks. And I think looking back to the PUD, what Chair Nemirov alluded to, like, yeah, this is pretty suburban. I think it changes now that you throw housing into it in a good way. I, I think that's one of the best attributes to this project and it, it creates more variety and diversity amongst the whole setup but with that I think there's change expectations I have of how you have to accommodate housing because before everything was very temporary you have a hotel you have extended stay hotels you have restaurants you have office everyone's just going there and leaving now you have people that are staying there and I think there's, I, I mean, there's greater expectations to now treat it like a village more properly. And I'm not seeing that addressed here. And I think, you know, of, of the projects, like we should put our foot down on and expect to see something better. Like this is 200 units of people coming there. I think, I think we have more responsibility than think, think about our other variance requests. You know, it's like one house, right? This is 200 houses, basically. So uh, I think I think I'm falling on the side of I just don't currently support it. A lot of things seemed 
on the development side, like some things are early on in this phase, but this is the final phase as we're seeing it. So, I mean, specifically what I'll, what I'll talk about is, I mean, it's nice to have the identification of all sides. I think that's a cool way to look at the project. Like each side has its own character. I do think it's just inverted. So it's like, since this is housing now, I mean, if this was like a hotel or something extended stay, I think this orientation works. But now that it's housing, it should better connect to what's inside of the development and it just has its back to it. And I think if we saw better renderings, if you had a street level view walking down a sidewalk with a wall and like a two foot strip of grass, like you would feel how empty that is. And it's hard to know what's across the street because it's not there yet. And so I, I don't think we should hold, hold our high hopes for what that's going to be. We should expect to see that now on this side so that it can complement it better later. Um, and so one way to do that is I see just like eliminate some of the parking inside of the building. If there is the ramp there, that we should use that more for the benefit of the project. So stepping in the, and articulating the building even more would be what I would support and just something better to address that connection. Um, regarding the affordability, I, I fully support this project in that sense, but that's a minimum, right? I think, I think we're distracted because it's happening in this project now, which I also support more than putting it into the fund. I think it's better to have it all over the place and in our projects, but that's a minimum. And this is modular construction. There's, there's saved cost and time with construction on that. And I, I mean, I would, I would hope to see something beyond the minimum. You know, there's been projects that have come to us where there's 20% affordable. Like if it was 20%, I'd get over the north side of this, you know, because that's a huge sacrifice, but I'm not seeing that much benefit to the overall character of this area and this is pentagon south right so the north is on the other side so like this is the south corner of this whole area so i guess just that's kind of where the i guess the, the stack of cards has fallen for me I, there's a lot of things i like but i think it's such a big project and there's such big potential and it sets the precedent for what's coming forward and I'd want to see something more exciting. So, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Bennett. Anyone else with any comments that haven't been shared previously or a motion to approve or not to approve? Or? <laughs> Everyone. I thought, sorry, Jerry, I thought you were going for your mic. You're not, are you no, making, are you making a motion? He made a motion, it just wasn't a motion for approval. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I move to uh, approve the uh, zoning ordinance amendment as submitted by the staff report. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second it. Is there any further discussion? Okay, Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote? And an I vote is a, is a vote to approve the plans as submitted. Commissioner Miranda. Nay. Commissioner Olson. Nay. Commissioner Alkire. Aye. Commissioner Bartling. Nay. Commissioner Strauss. Aye. Commissioner Bennett. Nay. Commissioner Agnew. Aye. Chair Nemrov. Aye. What was the four for? Okay. Take out your coin. <laughs> Do you have the ruby penny <laughs> <laughs> it could be similar to the to the interlocking yeah the motion so is what it is 
I want to think for just a moment. Oh, Commissioner Bartling, do you have a suggestion? No. Oh, oh. I was just seeing if I thought I was talking with my mic. I just want to make sure it's not. Well, the, just to remind everyone, the interlocking one, we did vote. We did have an opposite motion that also was a stalemate. So is that the next step in this? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Is there a, is there a separate motion? I mean, and just a mo I mean, there could be a motion to deny, but I'm suspecting it's going to be four to four. Yeah, I'll but move to deny. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any discussion? Ms. Olson, can you do a roll vote? Um, uh, an aye is a, is a vote to deny. Commissioner Miranda. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Elkire. Nay. Commissioner Bartling. Aye. Commissioner Strauss. Nay. Commissioner Bennett. Aye. Commissioner Agnew. Nay. Chair Nemrov. Nay. So yeah, that's four to four again. I'm wondering if there's some other resolution. I, I'm glad we did that. It gets clarified. It. Um, Commissioner Bartling. Does it make or is that or, or is, are we able to do that with like bringing back plans of re replanning of the north side or if there's other things that have been talked about as well maybe upping the ante thinking about their pro forma on I, I'm, I was a little too far usually I'm too loud so <laughs> um, anyways the um, you know the pro forma on what that is maybe we're looking at that and and maybe um, presenting something like that um, so, for example, I'm going, to throw, I'm going to toss a for example out. So you suggesting, like, if the applicant flipped the project, that a proposal on, the, on that condition, that sort of condition? I'm not necessarily saying that they should flip it, um, but maybe approach it in a way that it addresses the north side, because they're the designers, I don't want to push that too hard, but um, so that it seems like they're approaching and, and considering that the village side of things at a higher level along the sidewalk, along the walls, um, even maybe with some of the, the design elements of that side. And then also maybe the rethinking to that aspect of, of the percentages of affordable housing. I think that's a good suggestion. Commissioner Bennett, you, you had something? I, I was just gonna say, I, I think there's too many things and also too many unknowns, kind of what Commissioner Elkire, you know, referred to. I mean, I think, I, I mean, I need to see the solution. And I was willing, like, well, I did, <laughs> I guess to stand by my word, if the yeah the affordable was up to twenty percent, then I don't need to see it. But if that was changed, sure. But I really need to see the solutions. So I I wouldn't I wouldn't support that, and I don't know if that would change things. But I don't know if other okay. dissenters have. A well, I'd like to, I'd like to avoid just a a what if um, for a second at least. Planner Teague. Help me here again. I think that I think that's kind of a routine we're developing, where it's Planner Teague. Help me. Um, <laughs> I see a few different paths here, and one is the applicant can come back with a different plan. That's one path. I'm not recommend. These are I'm just you know, just trying to speak factually, and I'll, I'll give the applicant an opportunity to respond in a moment. But I want to confirm my thoughts with you. Um, second is we could just take another vote of some sort. I, third is we stop here, an applicant can appeal to council. Nothing has been approved. I don't think we can do a approval of a plan that hasn't been submitted, however, although we, there might be ways to put conditions on this that are very specific and approve that. Is, could, could you? Obviously, I'm kind of thinking as I speak. Could you re react to what I've said? Yeah, Continue I your think thoughts? those are those are all options. The conditions would have to be very specific for what exactly they needed to do. Um, otherwise, I'd put it to you. Could put it to the applicant. You know, it, this is just a recommendation, so it goes to City Council either way. 
Um, so whether you recommend approval or denial, um, the city council is very good at watching your meetings on tape, so they'll they'll hear all of your comments, um, unless there's something specific uh, that you. So I guess at this point I'm going to pause and, and invite the applicant to join this conversation. You have a lot. Of, what would you like? What is there any preference that you have on next steps here tonight? Well, I feel like honestly we failed you in in, the, in terms of not providing appropriate graphics to show the pedestrian experience on the north side of the building. So we've been working on this project with a, a wonderful design team. Um, you know, for a number of months, uh, and we feel very comfortable with the design of that space, of that element, with the setbacks, with the different components that we have. And I think we've just simply failed to show you graphically, you know, what that experience is going to look like. We have a huge vested interest, not only in this project, but in seeing the whole village be connected and, and put together. So, you know, this is what we do. This is what I've done for, you know, 30 years in the business. And um, and we connect things, you know, I've been involved with Harbor Lakes, a number of big projects around town where we specifically create town centers and make connections. And I feel very confidently that we are making these connections, um, but I don't think graphically we've been able to present that very well tonight. So, uh, so I, I take responsibility for that, but I, I do stand by the design. I think the design is a quality design all the way through. It's very well thought out. We've tested it a number of ways. We did not, I mean, the, the apartment building is already designed and approved, or I'm sorry, the hotel is already designed and approved on the north side. So there, you know, we know what that's going to look like. We know what the landscaping is, you know, so we, we are able to sort of react to that. And, you know, in one of the considerations, we certainly didn't want the pool and the public area of the apartments, you know, facing a five story hotel building either. So, I mean, probably the sun was the greater reason to flip it and do it facing the south, but there were other considerations, you know, in that in that process as well. So I see the dilemma. I, I can appreciate the dilemma and the concerns. I really do. Um, I, I do stand by our design. I think it's a, a really quality design. It's going to be excellent, not only for Pentagon Village, but for the whole community. Um, and I think, you know, our challenge is, you know, moving forward with the, with the city council is to provide graphic representation of that area in better light so that we can really show better what that space is going to look like. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Would that be your preference at this time is to you feel good about what you have and to go forward to the city council on the deadline? Uh, would that be your preference? Yes, as much as we certainly would love your support, and even unanimous support of the project. I mean, I understand the concerns. And like I said, I think we've just failed uh, those that have concerns by not showing the graphical representation of those areas. Uh, I think we'll do a better job of that uh, heading into the council to make sure that we can show those for their benefit and, and for their vote. But yes, I, I think we just assume move it forward. The the other option for you just 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 to verbally cover all the bases, overtly cover all the bases. You could pull it and come back and make another presentation or something. I'm just that I'm not I'm not recommending that. I'm not recommending against that. I'm just stating that's an option that you do have, and I, you know, if, if you'd like. Yeah, I don't honestly think we change it again, other than just showing you better graphical representation of the area, because I do feel very, very confident of that design. Thank you, Mr. Scott. So, well, I would say we would just move it forward. Okay, thank you, M Mr. Teague. Should that should that? I mean, we can we can entertain one more motion of something, I suppose. But otherwise, if we could move forward to the council and we can, and I will make sure I work with the applicant to um, ensure that they create some more graphics for the council to see. Uh, okay, and does that conclude our deliberation on this one then? It would. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for good discussion and good luck at your next, at the council meeting. Yes, thank you very much. Appreciate all of the comments, thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Well, everyone, um, that gets us to chair and member comments. And I'm wondering if any members have comments. Commissioner Miranda. Um, so today, today we had our uh, climate action plan work group meeting, um, uh, another three and a half hour meeting 
We're uh, currently working on actions that the city can take for different categories, including uh, one of which is uh, land use and transportation. So we had 130 potential actions that we're <laughs> working through and, and narrowing down. So um, this whole plan um, should be done by uh, September. So we've got a couple more meetings to go through on that. Um, my other comments are also about climate change, but not about the plan. Um, in terms of you know why I push so hard for even though you know a proposal may have affordable housing or it may you know solve other problems I'm always pushing for you know transportation change within it um, I just want to go through nine items that have been in the weather and climate recently so this past June was the hottest June on the planet ever um, we almost reached the hottest temperature ever reliably measured on the planet, which was, um, I think it, the, the record is 132 or 134, and we were 130. Um, we had nine record, we had record nine days with temperatures over 90 degrees in Minnesota so early in the year in early June. Um, even more concerning, we had record high low temperatures, and this is concerning for the health of our residents because um, when you can't cool down, uh, it's, a, it's a very big health problem. Um, Next week, we're predicted to reach 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and much of, what must, much of western Minnesota and the Dakotas will be over 100 degrees for close to a week. We had a heat dome over the Pacific Northwest that set record temperatures for two and three days in a row over large swaths of the states over there. Um, we're in a severe drought other than the great rain we had today. Um, couldn't miss the orange skies and orange sun we had over the past few days from wild, more wildfires, this time in Ontario. Um, and it's just, we're just at the beginning. This is gonna get worse every year. And we thought, you know, uh, Australia was bad and you know, it, it's super dry out west and we're gonna have more wildfires this year. Um, I think we're already up to the levels we had for all the last year. Um, so we have to change what we're doing because it's going to get worse unless we change. And we're a wealthy, well-to-do suburb and we're not used to having to change. <laughs> um, but we have to be a leader in this, I believe, and, and I think that's uh, part of why I'm here. So deprioritizing cars and prioritizing every other method of moving around the city and the metro area is a smart, forward-looking thing that I think Adina has to do. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Miranda, anyone else? Any other comments? Um, well, I would add, uh, I mean, just your list of facts. I mean, this is kind of, people talk about uh, the need to, I mean, the general scientific talk is to keep the increase in temperature below two degrees Celsius from over like, like last hundred years. But there are several parts of the country and that's on a global basis, so I don't think we're quite there, but that's the concern. But there are several parts of the country and the world that have already achieved that 2% gain, including northern Minnesota all the way through, through um, central, north, you know, the northern, north central Montana, Rhode Island, New Jersey, the whole state of New Jersey pretty much is 2% uh, warmer than it was a year ago. Lakes that they would, 100 years ago, were famous for ice fishing and ice harvesting don't um, don't need, don't really ice ice over anymore um so yeah i mean things things are changing anyone else with anything else i i had a few other things i wanted to share but thank you for your work on that lou i i you know um commissioner bennett yeah i just wanted to say again it's good to see you guys <laughs> and like i mean just appreciate what's been happening <laughs> with this world the last year and change it's nice to be in person again for while it lasts i suppose but that's it it's nice to see you too jimmy <laughs> i want to congratulate commissioner miranda the new house he's he's not going to be living in morningside right now no commissioner miranda is going to be living in the heights neighborhood no boo boo i've been i've been working on that one i guess i have a terrible delivery Miranda in the Heights? I got it. No. <laughs> okay. Not, maybe, you know, my family tells me I'm not funny. Maybe that's the feedback. <laughs> maybe they're right. <laughs> 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 
That's the funniest thing I have to say, huh? Um, we got some feedback and community comment tonight regarding the Burley site and affordable housing. We also got a letter came in tonight. If that matter comes before us, just let's keep that in mind. We'll probably hear again, but keep that before us. Uh, keep that in mind. Um, a meeting or two ago, I mentioned facial recognition. This is still a hot issue. Um, it's uh, in the bias bias effects that can occur from facial recognition, the loss, lack of privacy. And um, since that meeting, uh, it's a, it's, this is an issue I think is very important. I'm not sure I'm still working on whether that's something we can deal with or who, but I think it's a very important issue and it does affect people in housing. Since that meeting, the city of Baltimore has outlawed the use of facial recognition for about a year and a half. Uh, Congress had meetings, I think today, about the use of facial recognition in policing and the impact, and it's kind of a mixed bag because um, on the one hand, people are going to jail because of wrong identifications through face, use of facial recognition. At the same time, facial recognition was used to identify some of the people that broke into the Capitol on January 6th. And so, you know, bad, people are saying, well, there's good and there's bad, and we gotta work through it. So I, I, we do live in a, you know, I'll, I'll probably turn to this later, but it's a real issue that we're facing with society, just like global warming, it plays right into bias, plays into loss of security and privacy and private information. And um, next planning commission, oh wait, excuse me, wrong. Work plan, uh, next, next work session, excuse me, we'll probably talk about a variety of things. Um, we might follow up on the guidelines perhaps, we'll get a re, a revision of the Planning Commission guidelines. Um, we might talk about the work plan. I believe, Carrie, that we have to finalize that at the end of August. Is that correct, or September? It or? might be September, but that was the plan to be the, the bulk of the work session. We'll okay. Get our next meeting. Um, hopefully we can talk a little bit more about the Cahill Office Park. And, come up with a name other than COP or something. You know, Carrie wanted to come up with a more marketing name. Um, perhaps we'll talk about that, I don't know. Is that something you meant? And then we also wanna talk about meetings. I think in our last work session, we talked about how we handle certain types of matters. Uh, it might be, might be beneficial also to talk about, you know, processes. I mean, we're all kind of learning it when we're back and back together for the first time. Um, you know, and um, I just wanna share if anyone has any Again, if anyone has any feedback for me about things I could do better, I, I, one, of the, one of the guys I ate lunch with a lot during law school was in a, feel free, I was, in, you know, Carrie gave me some feedback recently and I hope I followed up on that a little bit, it was good feedback. Um, I went to law school, one of the guys I ate lunch with a lot my first year, I was an Olympic speed skater. I never saw anyone take feedback as well as he did and I've always aspired and I always look for opportunities for, to actually say to myself, boy, you take feedback as well as he did, you know, so I don't want to give me feedback. You'll be doing me a favor because I'll be actually, oh yeah, I'm never gonna be as good as he was, but you know, if you got feedback, give it to me. So that's uh, offline, hopefully. Um, that's, uh, that's everything I had. Staff, the staff have comments. Just quickly, the city council, um, as is the tradition, they don't meet the first, their first meeting in July, so since the last time we've met, the city council has not. So there were the two projects that, that the two bigger projects that you reviewed, the interlocking that will go to city council next week, and the other one was the solar garage, you recall. The applicant has decided not to appeal your decision, so the denial was final, and he's gonna submit a plan that meets code. That's it for me. Thank you, thank you. And then the next next plan commit next council meeting, I believe they're also taking a second a second read of the parking ordinance. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Has has there been public feedback? Yeah, there's been a lot of public feedback. It's it's in the packet, the the Better Together report. The packet for council. Packet for council. Yep. Okay. And will that go out on Friday? Or correct. And the meeting's yep. Wednesday. Correct. Okay. Anything else? Anyone? Bueller? Uh, that brings us to it's not uh, adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? My motion to adjourn. I'll second. Ms. Olson, could you do a roll vote for adjournment? Uh, an aye is, a, is an approval? <laughs> <laughs> Nay. <laughs>
Commissioner Miranda. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Elkire. Aye. Commissioner Bartling. Aye. Commissioner Strauss. Aye. Commissioner Bennett. Aye. Yeah, aye. Commissioner Agnew. Aye. Chair Olson. Sorry, Chair Nemirov. <laughs> aye. That was a compliment. Thank you. Good night.